Our first item of business in order is the consent calendar. Is there a motion? Motion to approve. Second. Any 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 uh, uh -oh. discussion? She, she doesn't. Technical. Hearing difference. none. All those in favor of the motion as stated, please say aye. Aye. All opposed. Motion carries. Our next item of business is the instruction portion, which will be chaired by Dr. O'Connor. And to my knowledge, Terry, there are no visitors. Okay, Dr. O'Connor. Well, she doesn't have a computer. I don't have my computer either. I'll lead it. There are technical difficulties. This okay. <laughs> Our next item of business in order is item 2.02. .02. There are no appearance of visitors. Uh, item 2.02 .02 is the reading progress on secondary level. Dr. Royster. Thank you, Mr. Sailors. Uh, as you recall, uh, last month's Thank Committee you. of the Whole, Mr. McCoy presented a presentation uh, regarding our efforts in reading instruction and intervention uh, focused on the elementary level. And as we mentioned then, uh, there, that was part one of a two-part presentation. Today you're receiving the second part of that presentation where Mr. McCoy is going to provide you with information regarding our efforts in the teaching of reading at the secondary level. Mr. McCoy. Yes, sir. Thank you, Dr. Royster. Um, so we're going to go through a very similar format presentation today with secondary as we did with the elementary. Um, just as, to remind you, um, yet last month we went through elementary balanced literacy, our core pro instructional program for elementary, um, and we talked about LLI and some of the other interventions we do with the elementary folks. So we're going to follow the same format today with the secondary. It is going to be a little bit different as far as what we do, obviously, for students. Um, similar to the elementary one, we do have a strategic plan um, goal. Um, for There's several of them, but this is the a main one, the Performance Goal 6, where 100% of middle schools will have targeted literacy intervention classes by 2023. Um, I will say, however, this is, uh, this is as of this year put in place already. We already have now the intervention classes in place. Um, so the next couple of years we'll, just work, we'll continue to work on improving the quality of those classes. Um, as, as this is new for everybody, both our teachers and our schools. So everything is in place, and now we're making refinements um, with that, our staff alongside with Dr. McDonald's help um, and Mr. Reimer's help in the middle school and high school classes. Um, so you can see very similar to the um, elementary one, um, provide targeted core reading instruction to meet the identified student's needs, and provide um, targeted reading intervention aligned to student needs as identified through evidence-based assessment. So that's where we're going to start today, is the two different areas, both core and intervention <coughs> for secondary. So similar to elementary, where our, our um, core instruction program is balanced literacy, in secondary, our core instruction program is disciplinary literacy. Elementary level, they kind of weave literacy throughout all the subjects as well. Um, so they try to integrate where they can into science and social studies and math. Disciplinary literacy is a little bit more um, intentional and focused in the secondary level because obviously the same teachers don't teach all four subjects. And so this is going to look a little different in each area. So that definition that we provide schools is just that students move beyond general reading strategies to, use, to the use of specialized reading practices to make sense of each um, discipline in the text, um, unique tasks, text. So looking at that, we're really going to focus on what does this look like? What does disciplinary literacy or literacy look like? What does that look like in math and science and social studies? So the focus is... Um, we talked about last time, really by the end of second grade or that mid-year point in second grade and above, um, really we start moving into comprehension. So ident identifying the fact that kids can read. Um, and now we've worked on fluency, we've worked on the phonetics, we've worked on the, comp on the foundations of reading. Now we're moving into actual comprehending, understanding what you're reading. And so second grade, mid again, midpoint second grade above. Obviously, middle school, high school focuses very heavily on comprehension. Um, by that point, they, they're reading, um, again, ex except for the kids that may be intervention for, for, for struggling readers. The majority of our kids are reading and focus on comprehension. So the core pillars, if you will, like we shared with balanced literacy last time, the core pillars are these three things on disciplinary literacy. And so this is, again, what we're training, that the whole Read to Succeed class that the secondary folks have to take. Um, that is a disciplinary literacy course they have to take. So how do you teach, how do you use literacy and teach literacy within your own classroom in social studies and 
um, even art and music. Um, so we're going to focus on the core instruction today or the core classes today, um, but it actually does expand into art, music, and the other um, disciplines as well. So looking at when a teacher is planning a lesson around their content area, so again, let's take social studies, um, what specific tasks will I give students? Um, un, you know, unlike when we were in school, where maybe we had teachers who would stand up and lecture to us for 50 minutes, hopefully not, but most of us, yes, um, 50 minutes of lecture, um, today's classrooms hopefully look a lot different than that. So it's kids engaged in a task. We want kids actually engaged in doing the work, um, engaged. And so what tasks will I give kids to work around? Again, social studies, that might be analyzing primary source documents, a speech by Abraham Lincoln. Um, so again, you can see where a literacy piece would come in there. And then a text. What texts support that task? So whatever I'm trying to get my kids to do in social studies, what text can I bring in? Now, the text should be related to social studies. So again, a primary source document, a secondary source document. It could be a political cartoon, um, whatever text I'm going to be using. Um, and then what questions will I prepare so students can talk about the text? This is probably a critical one. We're going to talk a little bit about DOKs. You'll remember that stands for um, depths of knowledge. And really, how do we get kids to think critically about um, certain areas of content? And so when you look at DOK3, which I'll show you in a second, that's a higher level question. That's just not what is the theme of the story? What is the main idea? Those are getting very high level questions, and those have to be planned out. Um, those don't come naturally to teachers. We have to actually really think about those in order to um, craft those. And so. The, again, looking at these four, now I focus on the four core content areas, but again, disciplinary literacy expands to all subject areas. Um, in art, they're going to be looking at, they could be looking at um, paintings and um, reading about the paintings um, in there, um, or an analysis of the painting that somebody has written. So there, it extends to all areas, but we're going to focus on the four core content today. Um, so you can see what it looks like through each of these lenses. We call them lenses when we're working with teachers, but what does it look like um, through the lens of a scientist? So that would look like reading informal text with an inquiry approach, the questioning approach like scientists do. Um, for history, it would be reading through the lens like of an historian, understanding perspective. Um, what was the point of writing this, you know, whatever, this speech or whatever it happens to be they're analyzing. Uh, for math, um, and a lot of people don't think about literacy in math, but um, there's a lot of literacy in math with charts and graphs, having to interpret those. Um, there's a big, uh, large part of literacy in that. And in English, is probably the most common. We know what literacy looks like in English, um, but um, paying attention to author's craft and looking at um, analyzing the various, whether it's novels or poems or whatever it happens to be. And so just some examples of each of these that it would look like in the, each of those lenses that we just talked about. So for science, for example, um, kids would hopefully be analyzing scientific abstracts, looking at scientific journals around topics they're reading, um, real world application. We don't necessarily want everything coming out of a textbook, but what are kids, are they actually engaging in stuff that they, in the world today that the kids might engage in or that adults might engage in? Um, obviously scientific investigations, which we're all very familiar with. And so that's that first bubble, that text. So what text are we going to gauge in? And then here's just an example, and you, I know it's hard to read on the screen. I only pulled out the small examples. In our guide that we provide the teachers, there's many, many, many more examples of this. But for an example of a task around science, it might be plan and conduct a controlled scientific investigation to answer these questions and test a hypothesis. Um, and then getting the kids engaged with each other, so talking about this. So uh, you can see the second one there, debate alternative explanations. Um, so we come up with a hypothesis, we test it, debating um, alternate explanations. So you can see the whole text, task, and talk, three legs of that stool there. So we talked about the depth of knowledge a little bit already. Again, DOK1, depth of knowledge, is going to be very surface level questions. So what is the main idea of this story, or what is an element? Um, DOK is going to get a little bit um, harder, um, analyzing, classifying, organizing. Um, DOK3 is going to move into um, more of the critical thinking that kids are going to have to do. It's going to be harder questions, not that you can just answer with a real quick necessary answer. Um, you can see those key concepts down there, forming conclusions, designing investigations. DOK4 is not a question. So DOK4 is going to be tasks that kids are engaged in for every content area. I'm, I'm spending a little more time on the science one, but it'll be replicable for math, social studies, and English. Um, you can see down there deducting relationships, analyzing data. So I might, give my ta I might give my kids in science a task of analyzing climate data over the last couple of years. Has climate changed? Has weather patterns changed? That's going to be more than a uh, one-minute analyzation to answer a question. That's going to be th something they're working over, talking over, and coming up with um, 
hopefully some solutions or hypothesis even. Um, so you can kind of see here, the first three really are focused on questionings. DOKs one through three are really about questions and levels of questions, critical thinking. DOK four is really a task. That's some sort of task, and there'll be questions embedded in that task, of course, but that's gonna be a little bit of a longer um, extended opportunity for kids to really dive into content. So for social studies, um, I already kind of mentioned this, we are very big in primary source documents and new standards. Um, that will be coming out, um, that came, will be coming out next year for 2020 standards and social studies. Um, does a lot of work around primary source documents, secondary source documents, really getting involved in looking, not again, just in a textbook, but actually analyzing some of these historical documents. Um, and then a big part, even literacy, we don't think about a lot of times, but there's a lot of, um, of teachers in classrooms you'll look in, in using political cartoons. You have to have a pretty in-depth understanding of what was going on in history at that time to really understand a political cartoon. Um, so they have to not only just analyze and look at the cartoon, they also have to understand what was going on in history at that point in time to actually get the cartoon, actually be able to analyze it. So there's a huge part of literacy in there. And so again, for social studies, um, they use evidence from a variety of primary sources to support a claim that somebody's made. And then probably um, one of the most important things we do through, through the history lens with disciplinary literacy is consider the source to determine bias and authenticate the event. Um, teaching our kids to read with that lens of, is the author have bias? Is the author coming at this from a certain perspective? And so it's important for us to teach our kids that um, even today. Um, every news source, many news sources have bias in them. And so being, helping kids to recognize that bias and form their own conclusions. And so again, so studies you can kind of see again the DOKs. Um, that go through, really it's the key concepts down there that change a little bit, um, justify how and why with evidence they can point back to in DOK 3. So again, you can see if teachers are asking questions about site evidence and history of such and such, that's a little bit more going to be a little bit more of a higher level of actually finding that evidence and claims. And so math examples, again, this is probably the most difficult one people see with literacy and math, but if you think about that, the statistical papers, um, more in high school that we're going to be, would be using uh, maybe in math, and then trying to tackle, tackle those real-world um, connections. So sales flyer, as simple as being able to look at sales flyer or credit card interest before you sign up for a credit card. Those kinds of reading the terms and understanding the terms and the math within the terms of that literacy um, piece. And then, of course, charts and graphs. Again, being able to look at the X and Y axis, understanding what X and Y is, um, is um, giving you the data or what, what, um, what it's representing in the chart is critical as well for literacy. And again, tasks might be, so one thing in math, so the new math standards really focus on mathematical habits of thinking. Um, again, this is a very big shift from when you and I were in school. Most of us could um, cite some sort of, um, you know, little trick we learned to, say, divide fractions. Um, and so, you know, you invert the numerator, denominator, second one, you cross multiply, okay? But how many of us actually know why we do that? We know how to divide fractions, but we know, we know the why behind it. So the new standards really focus on why are you doing that? <clears throat> and so you can see there, um, that's one of the big focuses on the new mathematical standards. Um, and then kids for talking, presentations of knowledge and ideas, or explaining um, that. Why, why do we invert um, the numerator and denominator and cross multiply? What is happening behind the scenes of why we are doing that? Um, as a matter of fact, the test questions today a lot of times are going to ask that. They may not ask the kid to even solve the problem. They may, ask, uh, they may solve the problem for the kid and ask them why it's right. Um, to work backwards to figure out why the solution is incorrect or correct. Um, so it's a very high, higher level critical thinking than just solving the problem. And again, the mathematical DOK that you can kind of see as it progresses from DOK 1 to a task. Again, in math, we really are focused on kids working around a task and solving a problem in the new mathematical standards. Get actually, kids doing math, um, not necessarily just watching a teacher perform the math on the board. And so finally, English, um, again, this is probably the most, um, the most uh, area that we think about literacy in. Um, kids obviously are looking at novels, and they're looking at memoirs, and they're looking at poems, not just reading them, but actually analyzing them, analyzing them for author's craft, or picking out various elements of why they use um, certain elements of literature um, inside the stories. Um, so there's a, there's a million examples of this in English, of course, but uh, the last one there for a task might be evaluate the use in effective language. Um, and they, kids might talk around collaborating with others to evaluate the effectiveness of craft techniques found in text. Why did the author use this craft technique? Uh, was it effective or was it ineffective? Um, and so kids, again, can kind of debate that and talk that through. So, and again, there's the ELA, DOKs as they move up. And mostly what changes is that mid-portion there as far as um, changes by subject matter as far as what it looks like. So... We talked about that. That is our core instructional program. So, read, uh, for, so the um, 
Disciplinary literacy is core instruction. That's what every child gets, hopefully in every classroom, whether it's science, social studies, math, art, music, whatever it happens to be, we're embedding literacy in that. So what about those kids that are struggling in the middle and high school? And obviously we have those kids that struggle as well. Um, we have less kids, obviously, at middle and high school that can't read, um, and truly can't read, as we talked about last time. Um, many of the times those kids at Greenville um, is, obviously gets kids from all um, areas of the state and country. Um, we do get kids occasionally in that come in that um, don't, they've not been in school for four years, and so maybe they don't read. And so how do you help a child that is at that level? We also have students with disabilities. Students with disabilities who, because of their disabilities, may be a little bit slower picking up on the reading. They just need some more supports and structures in order to help them um, meet the same um, level of proficiency in reading as um, our gen ed students. So we've implemented um, through special education departments, special ed bought two years ago, Read 180 and System 44. Um, these are intervention programs, and as I mentioned from the first slide, um, these are actually in classes. So these are classes that kids would go to where the teacher is working. They are simply not programs. There's a component of that where it's direct instruction, and then there's a component of it where kids are rotating into um, what I would call personalized learning, where they're actually working on the skills and honing the skills as well that they need to progress. And so we're going to start with middle school, the results of the middle school. Initially, what they do is they take a reading inventory assessment. And you can see there, based on how they score, what Lexile they score at, is where, depending upon whether they go to System 44 or whether they go to Read 180. So you can see if it's less than or equal to a 600 Lexile level for secondary. If it's less than that, that which is really level one, they're going to go into the System 44. And as you see, System 44 is going to focus a little bit more on phonics inventory, phonics, um, those early reading strategies that maybe they're just lacking for some reason. Again, whether they have had, haven't had the same schooling as everybody else and not on the same grade level necessarily. Um, they've come to us from another country, um, so they're still learning some of those basic foundational readings um, in there. And then if they score above 600L, they go into Read 180. And so that's how the system determines where they go. And there are two different purposes and two different programs. So some of the results we've had with middle school with System 44. Um, of the 838 students in the program, um, we are going to focus on the results for the 689 that you see down there at the bottom, which is about 82% of those 838 kids. Um, now, by the end of the year, that number will be higher. There's a lot of reasons why all those kids necessarily aren't in that, that bottom sample. Um, they do have, you read the fine print down there, they, um, they have to have had at least 10 software sessions and a minimum of two phonics inventory assessments at least eight weeks apart. Some kids may struggle to get that in that time frame. Doesn't mean they're not going to get it, they're just at a different pace. Um, so we'll, that number will hopefully be higher at the end of the year where we'll have more kids in the sample. But we're going to look at those 689 students that um, met that, that criteria. So of those students, we had, um, of these, this one is the 747 actually, the reading inventory at the bottom that you see. The ones that took the reading inventory, we have 69% of them that had Lexile gains, um, which is obviously what we want to see. We want to see the kids progressing through Lexiles. Um, we had 23% of students who met their end of year goal. And I should say, this is the information we pulled in January. So we pulled mid-year information. This is not the end of the year yet. Um, and then we had 6% of students who met two times their goal. So what the goal was that the system set for them, they actually exceeded that goal um, by twice. And then students who um, improved their college and career readiness level. College and career readiness level is a level that by 11th grade we expect kids to be um, at a, a, a 1387, I think it is, um, Lexile level as far as what they would consider kids prepared for um, college or career. Um, so that's a progression. That's going to not, all, all kids are not going to be at that level, many of them, before 11th grade. And so just some of the phonics and reading inventory results. So you've got two assessments within the system 44. You've got the phonics inventory and you've got the reading inventory. So on the, for, on the phonics side, you see that we've got 70% of our kids improved their accuracy. Again, those are going to be a little bit more on the um, early reading strategies. Uh, fluency and growth, um, of four or more points, 37% kids um, grew in that area. And then decoding, advanced decoding, 9% of our kids grew. Um, you can see on the um, reading side, 769% uh, rather um, improved their Lexile. And 23% actually exceeded their annual growth goal, which is, again, very um, proud of those students. And so this is one, I'm going to pull this up over here. This, is, this will give you one example of um, how this worked with um, Knox. Um, Knox, um, Read 180 and System 44 do this, these awards based on kids, how fast they grow um, or the growth that they have. Um, and so he, and, um, he won $500 worth of books um, for his choice um, from the Read 180. 
and his teachers and his mom talks about the experience from Knox. My name is Vanina Haley and I'm Knox's Read 180 teacher. Knox is a ninth grader and he came in class and you can tell he just really did not want to be in Read 180 again. And so during independent reading time, I would have the kids select their books. Well, I noticed that Knox would read a book for a few days and then he'll come back in and he'll say, I need a new book. At the beginning of the school year, I just hated reading. I never wanted to do it at all. It was very boring to me and I just hated it. If I could start from the beginning, he was born early and so from that day forward, he always he had to learn to walk. Everything was delayed, but he caught up. But then in first grade, we noticed that he was struggling with reading and writing. And it was just he wasn't able to keep up with the other students. Um, and then as each grade, he progressed in each grade, the um, struggle to read was still remained a big problem for him. So we went through all the books. I asked him what was he interested in. So I found the book, um, Tim Howard, the soccer player, and he reluctantly said he'd give it a try. So he started reading, and then he would come in every class every day and ask to read again. My favorite book I read this year is The Keeper, and it's about a man that went to the Olympics for the USA, and he had Tourette's. And when I introduced the software, he was just like, oh no, we're not doing that today. I want to read, Miss Haley. Can I read? I can see the lights, you know, go off in his eye. And he was just like, I want to read. Reading reading time was key for him. Since he's been reading 180 at home, he's willing to read little things. Like if I give him my phone and say, will you read those directions, he'll read them. Whereas before, he wouldn't do it. And he'll pick up a book now. And actually, I'll see him reading instead of playing on his phone. And now he is my top reader in my sixth period class. In the first attempt zone, in the, in the reading zone, the first attempt column, he scores anywhere from 80s to almost 100. And it's just like everything is okay now with him. Um, at the beginning of the year, he was um, more hesitant to um, be assertive. Um, to ask questions, but as the year has pr progressed, um, he's become so much more confident. That's the word that just across the board, when I've spoken with his teachers, they all speak of the increase in his confidence level. My favorite class at Eastside is World Geography, and Read 180 has helped me in that class by when I read in front of the class and I like stop and think about the words, I can just clearly read. He's gone from, from cross country, I think, to now participating in wrestling. It's now he's like a global student. What I want to be when I grow up is I want to go into welding and read one of these prepared me for welding like so I can read better. My lifestyle has grown from 500 to 30 and it went up to 730 recently. You can see um, they talked about this a little bit in the um, in the video, but a lot of the um, a lot of it has to do too with building the confidence of kids who have struggled who are struggling readers and building that confidence as a reader, and that really does impact other areas of their life. We know reading transcends into every subject matter. If you struggle to read, you're going to struggle in geography, you're going to struggle in math, you're going to struggle in science. So building those reading skills is critical. So you saw many t different support people in that in that video. So it wasn't just one adult working with them. There's many supports available for the students. This again, I think I mentioned, is a special, this is for special ed students as far as the Read 180 System 44 in our district. That's what um, we bought it with special ed funds um, for the students. Um, and I've seen some good results with this as well for the, for the students. So the Read 180, so we just talked about System 44. Again, remember that's for the lower Lexile, so kids that may actually really truly be struggling in reading. So the Read 180, um, again, very similar reports. You can see um, we're going to uh, 378 kids in the middle school that we're going to talk about um, in these graphs. So very similar. You can see the Lexile gains, the end of year go growth goals. 42% um, already met their end of year goal by January. Um, now that doesn't mean they stop. They'll keep progressing and they'll keep moving and so hopefully they'll meet twice their goal. You can see they've 21% met twice their goal. Hopefully at the end of the year 40% will meet or 50 or 60% will meet twice their end of year goal. Um, and then by school, you can see our results here. So this is half the middle schools. The next slide has the other half of middle schools. Um, and what this represents to us, and Dr. McDonald looks at this regularly, our staff looks at this regularly, um, what we would say here is based on the, again, the results we pulled in January, um, this is where we get a kind of indication of where do we feel like our kids are going to fall out at the end of the year. So you can see on this first slide, really the green represents kids who have already exceeded their goals um, by January they've already exceeded their goals. Now they'll keep on going um, and they'll hopefully again they'll continue to make gains. 
The yellow are kids that were not quite there yet. They had not met their goals. And again, we don't expect them to in January. We expect them to meet their goals by the end of the year. Um, and we believe all of those ki the kids are the, b the bars there. Um, the students there will all meet their goals by the end of the year as far as yellow. They're on track to meet those goals. Um, the next slide here, again, you'll see the yellow all on track to meet their goals, we believe. We had two reds. Um, we actually believe the reds will meet their goals now. Um, typically, when you see red at the January, which is why we pull this information at the mid-year, um, typically it's, it's looking at the implementation of it. Um, so is something not being implemented correctly? And so Dr. McDonald worked with those two schools um, to really look at their implementation plan, how they were implementing the READ 180, and then put additional plans in place to correct um, and maybe have, have higher growth goals by May. And so we believe that, that those kids actually will make growth um, as well. Um, so that is valuable information for us to pull mid-year so we can see where we may have some implementation program for problems. Again, this is fairly new for us, and so we recognize you've got new teachers coming in. There's going to be some times where we have to do some remediation with teachers or coaching of teachers to kind of help them with this program. And so system, we do this in high school as well. So system 44 results in high school. Again, very similarly, uh, 186 kids that we're talking about with these, this analysis review. I'm not going to spend as much time on these slides because you've already seen them, um, not the same slides, but you've seen them now for the middle school. Um, but again, fairly good results, 70% Lexile gains in, 64, um, in System 44 for high school, 26% who met their end of year goal, 7% twice their goal. Same thing for phonics and um, reading. Again, we do have some kids in the um, System 44. You would expect there to be less in high school. Um, but again, um, depending upon the student's disabilities, um, you heard Knox's mother talk about um, developmentally, he was behind, and so that, that's going to follow him. Um, that he may be behind in many cases um, as he moves, but he's going to get there. He just may get there a little slower than some of the kids, but with the right supports we put in place, hopefully he'll make those gains. Um, this will be true for any kid that might be in System 44. And then the Read 180 results, very similar. Um, 281 students who were in um, the Read 180. We had 73% of those had Lexile gains, 49% of them already met their end of year goal. So about half of those kids met their end of year goal in January. Um, and then 30% met twice their goal, growth goal already. Um, this is the college, as I said before, this is the college and career ready Lexile performance. Really the most important thing, the easiest thing to interpret down there is that um, 50, uh, at the very bottom there, that green, um, 50 kids or 18% of our kids moved up, 80% stayed the same level and 2% of our kids um, moved down in there. And again, the move down may be a, an assessment issue as far as just didn't take the assessment, you know, weren't 100% on board with the assessment that day. That happens with kids, obviously. Um, seven kids. And again, this is, this is progress towards college and career ready. So if you remember, 1387 is the goal by the time they're in 11th grade. And so we track the kids' progressions. We don't expect kids to be at 1387 in sixth grade. Um, that, that would be you know, unreasonable. Um, certainly there are some kids that will be, um, the high, high achieving kids, but for most kids we expect them to be at that 1387 level by 11th grade. And then similar to the high schools you can see there, um, our high schools were all on track to either meet their goal by the end of the year or have already exceeded their goal um, already. Um, again, they'll continue to work on that. That's the low end growth goal. Um, they give a range from low end to high end as far as growth goals go. So hopefully these, when we pull these, um, these charts in May, um, hopefully many of our kids will have met their high-end growth goal, which mean, would mean they have some fairly significant growth in reading and literacy over the year. Um, for, the, for, the regular, for the general ed students, we have language live. So anybody who's struggling with literacy or struggling in reading um, and comprehension um, in, in the gen ed classroom would go into language live. So special ed uses read 186 and 44, um, general ed uses language live. And so similarly, um, we identify kids, you can see their criteria on the left there is how we identify the kids that may need the language live. Um, 94 kids in ninth grade are currently in, uh, in um, language live, 187 sixth and seventh grade. There are some seventh graders in language live as well in most of our middle schools. So that, that really should say sixth and seventh grade as far as language live goes for them. And so some of those results, very similar to, to System 44 or Read 180. Um, we did have in the fall, um, sixth grade so far, from the fall to the winter, we had a change of 57 Lexiles or point growth. The goal was 50 points, so we did exceed that growth already in January. Um, and again, those kids will continue in there um, to meet their uh, higher goals. Um, in ninth grade, we actually had a little bit higher growth. In ninth grade, we had, um, again, 50 point goal was the, grow, was the goal. Um, we had a 73 point gain in high school, so um, from 836 to 909 Lexile level uh, overall. So last time we had some questions about um, assessment, so I just wanted to really quickly 
um, I think it was Mr. Suddeth that asked about the assessments in um, secondary. Um, we obviously don't do fonts to finale every year like we do in, in balanced literacy in the elementary grades, but there are some tests that, te that test reading, obviously. One of those is PSAT, and you can see, I'm not going to read all those things, you can see what the content of those tests are. PSAT really focuses on the evidence-based reading and writing, uh, it has a reading test, and it has a writing and language test as well. Um, SAT, again, you can see what that looks like. Um, the big categories of production of writing is a big focus for SAT, knowledge of language, and then conventions of standard um, English. And you can kind of see the points and the percentage of the test that makes up as well. For ACT, um, three sections or three components of that focuses on English including the grammar, usage, and punctuation, um, reading, again, comprehension of reading, how, how well kids can read and can they comprehend what they're reading. Um, and then writing, of course, uh, they have an essay prompt, so they do have to demonstrate writing skills on the ACT as well. So the EOC, this is the EOC blueprint, the test of the EOC blueprint. You can see that 67.1% of the blueprint um, focuses on literacy and reading. And at the bottom there, 32.9% of that test focuses on writing. So it's about a third to two thirds as far as makeup, as far as how it's weighted. Um, and then the text dependent analysis I showed you last time, uh, actually I'm showing you this time um, in a second. The text dependent analysis, so we'll explain what that is, makes up about 21.9% of the test. That has been the hardest shift for our kids with these new standards. The text dependent analysis is very difficult. And so we have really struggled um, with that. It's a huge shift from what we used to do um, to where we are now, and so we have struggled with that, and so I think we've made some good gains last year according to the test results, and I think we'll make better gains this year um, as our kids get better at text-dependent analysis text. It's just a, it's a skill they have to develop, um, and so it's, it's taken us a couple years to develop that within our kids. Um, so here's some examples for those of you who may never have seen. What, when we talk about TDAs or text-dependent analysis, what does that mean? So this is what a text-dependent analysis is. So in sixth grade, you can see um, in Charles, which is a um, reading, passage, kindergarten, kindergarten and Lori lies about the existence of a troublemaker named Charles. Write an essay analyzing how and, how and why Lori is able to convince his parents that Charles is a real student in class. So if you think about that, write a well-developed essay in which you are used strong and relevant text evidence to support your analysis. So if you think about that, how different that is from when we were in school, when we, had, we were asked to write a narrative essay about our summer vacation or a narrative essay about our whatever it happens to be. Um, this, they actually have to read the text, comprehend the text, understand the text, and then they have to, in some cases, infer um, some things that the author is saying or picking up on language that the author's, uh, author's using. Um, in this case, analyzing why Lori was able to convince her parents that Charles is a real, real student. So what did Lori say or do that um, she was able to convince her parents that Charles was a real student? Um, and then English one, um, one passage is to finish to win, write an essay analyzing how the author develops the theme. Um, use evidence from the passage to support your response. So that seems like a simple question, but you think about it, kids have to know what a theme is. If they don't know what a theme is, they can't answer that question. So they have to understand theme, um, and then they have to um, write the essay analy analyzing with evidence how the author develops that theme. So, um, and there's a second um, example there as well, write an essay analyzing how the author uses the interaction um, to develop a theme. Um, use evidence from the passage. So there's a the big piece. If they just write without the evidence, they're not going to gain points on that essay. So they actually have to use evidence from the text in order to write that passage. So hopefully that'll give you a little bit of just insight on the TDA and why that's so hard, why our kids struggle. Um, and if you remember, text dependent analysis goes, starts in third grade on their test and goes all the way up until, uh, well, third through eighth, and then of course the English one EOC also contains text dependent analysis as well. So those are just three examples um, that we have on the state blueprint that um, they gave us some guidance on as far as what, it, what a typical text dependent analysis might look like in there. Um, the seventh grade, most of you probably have read The Giver, so that seventh grade example might be a little bit more closer to uh, uh, understanding what, if you understand The Giver and, and read that book, um, The Giver presents the reader with a dystopian society heavily controlled by the community's elders, and as essay explain how the reader becomes aware as early as chapter one that even the children in this society are controlled by the unseen ruling elders. If you look at that text, if you've read The Giver, that is a heavy question. Um, you have to understand dystopian and what that is. Um, it, the kids may or not have read that that book necessarily, they will give them passages um, a lot of times. Um, they don't necessarily expect them to have read a certain book, um, but there's a lot in that concept. If you read The Giver, um, it's, it, there's a lot of hard concepts in that for seventh grade. Um, and so they have to understand a lot going on that, in that story in order to be able to answer that question and cite the evidence um, from there. So I think that's the um, conclusion of the presentation. If anybody has any questions. Any questions, Mrs. Grayson? 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, kids, how often are kids tested for their Lexal range? Is this the beginning of the year? January and then again at the end of the year? You mean with 3180 and mm -hmm. 644? So that, yeah, so that actually can happen throughout the year based on when they, they're meeting those benchmarks of the tests. So it's, it'll, it'll analyze that, those Lexile growth all along for them based on the tests and the assessments they're taking. And how do they graduate from read 180 you said that they just keep going I mean what if they're at 1300 so. yeah so typically what we would we would give guidance to the schools on is when they have when they're on grade level or where the Lexile range will be on grade level is typically where we are, would expect them to come out of that program or graduate if they're in system 44 to graduate up into read 180 um, in that but yeah we the, the intention with any intervention is the kids are not in it forever um, okay. the whole goal is to get you to where you mm -hmm. need to be on grade level and then move on so you said 1387 at 11th grade where is what's the goal for ninth grade and 10th grade and so I would um, well let's see so at grade level for ninth grade would be 1050 to to 1079 for example okay and what about 10th 10th grade would be 1080 to 1184 okay and then is there even one for 12th grade or do we assume there is not they're going to be out by then because the goal then is to get them over 1300 somewhere and then let them yeah go. i would say today honestly and, and you probably have heard this research now this is classic some of this changes slightly but this is pretty 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 standard as far as where the lexile ranges by grade levels go um most adults lexile range most adults they will have you heard a statistic read somewhere between in the middle school level sixth to ninth grade is really where most adults are as far as as reading i mean that's just typical 1387 is a fairly high that's a fairly high lexile um that is just depressing it, yeah if you look at the research i mean in sixth grade i say sixth grade it's it, that's a fluent reader um should be a fluent reader um you're gonna have everybody from six to twelve obviously in that range but um, 1387 is a fairly high Lexile, 1387 above. That's why there's no 12th grade Lexile. Um, okay. 1387 and 11th grade is where our goal would be. So the numbers of high school students in, these, in either of these programs is surprisingly low. I mean, there's only 326 in the whole district in high school in Read 180, and then 228 in the System 44. I mean, there's basically, uh, it's the top I mean, less, number. Less than 1,000 in... Yeah in high school is is pretty amazing is that something that they opt into or do we have to get their parents to support it how does that work? no we would not we don't need they they, they don't go. opt into it they go <laughs> we okay. identify them for it okay. um and based on that then they would be scheduled into the class they would be scheduled into the read 180 or system 44 language live class based on the criteria we've set to identify them and can they move out during the year or do they have to wait till the end of the year so in elementary, they can move out. Um, middle school, they probably, if, they, if it's on a semester basis, they don't think you have any on the quarter basis um, classes. Semester basis, they could move out um, because we have the ability to change. It'd be hard for them to move out like in four weeks though because then you'd be putting them into a class that's already mid-started. So right. typically we'd want those break points. And what about high school? High school would be very similar. If they're on a block schedule, they could move out. You know, The problem is if you move them out and put them in, another class mid-year they wouldn't get credit for that class because they wouldn't meet the seat time um, so typically what they would do it's not going to hurt them if they've exceeded their let's say they've exceeded their grade level or they've hit their grade level benchmark um, it's not going to hurt them to stay in there for another month or two they're only going to continue to exceed and excel in the reading piece so it's going to help them but um, at that point block schools could choose to move them out into another class for now if they're a block school now if they're seven period day again most likely they'd be in there for the year yeah okay unless they have something to pair with all right great well thank you that's it. Mr. Meek. Jeff, um, can we go back to the middle school read 180 graphs on page 30 and 31? Was that these two? I don't have page numbers up here. Oh, do what now? Is it this graph here? Yes. Okay. What does the, um, tell me again, or tell us again, what the two bars represent? So the two, the gray bar there is the gray bar is representing the number of Lexile points as an average they should grow. So that would be 75 points. This is based on after they take that assessment, it's set because you see the gray bars are very different. It's based on the kids, the makeup, and where they are as far as their reading goes. The green bar on each of those, or yellow bar, red bar, depending upon which school you're looking at, there is actually how many, um, how much gains they've had in those Lexiles um, points over the course of, for us in this case, would be five months, so from August to January. Okay, so so the the one bar, the gray bar, is where they should be. 
That's their goal. Their That's goal. their goal. Mm -hmm. and, and the other is actually where they are at? Um, at this point in time in January. Okay. And so it's not based on two different tests then? No, this was the READ 180, correct? Yes, READ 180. No, this, this would be on the same, t they're, they're in the same program um, from, from August to January. Okay. So thinking of it as there, when the kids take the assessment as a whole, they are getting an average um, or a mean Lexile um, score. And so those goals are set then as, as a whole, those kids should grow 75 points or 64 points or 77 points. The green bar in January or May uh, would be actually how many, the, how many overall mean Lexile points the, actual, the kids actually grew throughout that year. Now that's obviously going to vary by child. And so we would look at, and the schools would look at very individually students um, as far as, you know, Roger Meek may not have grown 75 points, but he may have grown, you know, 40 points or whatever it happens to be. So we would look at those kids very individually as far as how much they've grown and, and whether or not the individual kids met their goal. Okay. I don't understand it, but thank you. It's, <laughs> it is a little complicated. But <laughs> Mrs. Morrison Fair. Thank you. Uh, let's stay with the same chart. What are they doing over at Northwood to have those types of, um, that type of success? And where do those kids, most of those Northwood kids, what high school do they feed to? Northwood, um, east side, okay, well then that explains the other chart, okay. And, and at east side, you saw had, well I don't have the high school, but east side had some fairly significant growth too. Now I will say the, again, the growth law that has to do with the implementation as well, and so that's what mm -hmm. we're perfecting. We've implemented this in all 14 high schools and all um, 18 middle schools. Um, I would expect that over time, this, this will, these will get better even still over time. Dr. McDonald's worked very hard. They meet with their breakouts a lot of times. They talk about the READ 180, the System 44, as does Scott Saran with his breakout. So, I mean, that's, a, that's been a focus for them as well, the, the, these guys working. And David's um, particularly working, I know, in some of these schools. Um, Northwood, I don't know, David, if you have an explanation for their higher growth. Northwood has an extremely There we go. Northwood has a very strong teacher. She um, has actually been a model teacher for us. We have sent other schools, some of these that have the yellow and red bars, we have sent those teachers to visit her. Um, she's been a really, really um, strong advocate for the programs and has done a phenomenal job of implementation. And so we see those, those bars are stronger where the implementation has been high. Um, it's very encouraging. I know yellow and red are not the favorite colors, but what's encouraging is that we, in most places, are at the halfway mark or above in January. So when you look at Northwood and they're substantially ahead of their goal already before the end of the first semester, really, um, it's really encouraging and we're looking forward that, that they will all be green is our goal by the end of the year. And the only thing I would add to what Dr. McDonald said, I think we're, we're concerned with the red. Really the yellow simply means they're, they're doing what we, That's right. what we expect for them to do. They're on target to reach their goals by the end of the year. The greens, they've just far exceeded what would reasonably be expected. And as we have more experience with this, obviously we will probably reset our expectations. Uh, we, don't, we don't know based on this year's uh, whether uh, our expectations ought to increase a little bit, and they, they probably should. Maybe not appreciably, but they should because the expectations were set, again, I believe, Jeff, based on reaching that score by the 11th grade, 11... Well, these expect the expectations in Read 1A System 44 are actually set based on where the student is in the assessment system. So based on that but, assessment... But moving towards the... For the college and career ready, yes. Right. And, you know, it might be helpful, that, though the question wasn't asked. You know, we throw out terms sometimes when we talk about Lexiles. Uh, just a, a brief overview. What, what, is a, what does a Lexile mean? Kind of set that in context in, in layman's terms. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um. do, do you want to phone a friend? Yeah. You wanna... <laughs> so, well, if, if, Dr., if Dr. McCrary were here, we, 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 we'd ask and him, he, but I'm he, not he, sure he could put it in a layman's I know. term. So, so, let me, if, so in layman's terms, I should put this chart in here, I guess. Um, so in layman's terms, when the students take an assessment, so whether it be MAP or whether it be um, 
you know, read one eighty six and forty four, they all have um, formulas, if you will, when they take an assessment that kicks out a Lexile range based on a lot of different um, categories as far as where the student's reading in that range. Um, and so we have a chart that we use that actually says, if it kicks out and says, Dr. Ball O'Connor is at a 1050 and she's in 11th grade, we would say that she's one grade level below in Lexile range. And so it's just a matter of once that assessment's given, it kicks out a score. Um, and I'm not sure that's layman's terms necessarily, but I'm not really sure how to explain it differently. Does that help? If, if your goal is this, mm -hmm. it breaks distance to that goal in equal measure. Across. And we, we select one of those measures as being appropriate for where you ought to be in order to get to that goal by the time you hit that grade, which would be 11th, 11th grade. grade. Does it, I don't know, does that help? Starting any? at first grade? Well, in this case, starting with entering uh, sixth graders, starting at middle school. But you could tie it yes, back. Yes, you could go back. You could tie it back to elementary. Yeah, the charts that we use really are, they start at, um, for kindergarten, for example, it's the Lexile top range is 189. So it, yes, it would start all the way back in kindergarten as far as kids progressing. But yeah, so starting at the 1387 um, and then moving backwards as far as where kids should be in each grade level um, based on their assessments. And, and if I could just add that many of these kids, keep in mind all of these students are students with disabilities. So some of these children have significant reading disabilities already. And so by providing this extra support, we're seeing tremendous growth in many, many of these kids' uh, ability to be at a higher grade level before the end of the year. And now, those are the ones in one system, not the other. That's the correct. other system includes all students. That's correct. That would be Read, read 180 and System 44 are both our special needs students. And again, the goal is, and I think we've had a few cases of this, the goal would ultimately be if a student has an IEP for reading or for writing or for um, literacy and they're exceeding and they're getting on grade level and getting you know, to where they need to be, ideally they would be coming off an IEP um, at the end of the day. I mean, that's the whole goal, was the IEP is there to support them until they've mastered that content and on grade level and then you would look at um, they don't need those supports anymore. Make that statement again. You said all students in 180 are. So Did you say special? There's, there's all, yes, there are students with disabilities. All students disabilities. read 180 and System 44 um, is paid for out of, uh, from, from Ms. Hogan's department. So that's okay. for special ed students. And then language live is for um, the general, uh, general ed students. Okay. Thank you very much. But I would like to kudos to Northwood because <laughs> when, I, when I compare this, I guess we go back to the best influences to qualified personnel That's in the right. classroom. But I looked at even the schools with less students than Northwood still did not do as well as Northwood. So that's really, that's really kudos to Northwood. I love to meet that instructor. Yeah, and to the <laughs> principal's credit, credit too, and Dr. McDonald and Mr. Reimer, they've really, they spent a lot of time really embracing this and talking about this in their breakout mm -hmm. session. So I think the principals have recognized the power this has. If you're moving kids this quickly, obviously it's helping overall, not just students, but also the scores. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Dr. O'Connor. Thank you. This is very um, exciting to see and hear about. I appreciate the, all the intentional work going on to reading at these levels. Um, I want to ask if when you are speaking about the language live group, are they identified, for example, at the end of eighth grade, they're reading below grade level, so they're already automatically put into this class as ninth graders? And the same would be true as fifth grade would be identified to go into sixth grade? So yeah, so I know a lot of the schools have worked out that, and it's a little tricky in, in, in green because of the feeder patterns that we have, um, because they, go, they can go all over the place, obviously. Uh, but yes, the goal would be, now I would just say this down the road, the goal hopefully would be that we don't need it in ninth grade, because we're catching them all you know, in sixth and seventh grade. Mm -hmm. So you know, very few, unless they're coming to us from other places and they can't read and all that, um, or, or struggling with comprehension. But yes, they, the schools have been pretty intentional about the supports that the students need going into the, the, the benchmark grades, if you will, of ninth grade or sixth grade. So it simply means you arrive at scoring below grade level, then you're automatically put in here. What does it do to, the, to your um, transcript when you're looking at the requirements for English for ninth grade? Does it postpone that or do you do it in an 
addition to? Yeah, we do it in addition to. So it would be, a, I think it's a support class at high school is what we call it. Um, so they can get an elective credit of some sort for it. Um, but they would typically be doing, doing English one and at the same time. Because it could take them two years in Language Live um, to really get caught up. Or three. Or, or three four. I mean, they could Absolutely. be in it theoretically all four years. Could be. If they're not progressing, reaching where you want them to reach. And at the same time, continuing on with their coursework yes. as usual. Yes. Now, okay. I would say it'd be rare probably for them to exceed two years. Um, we would probably intervene and look at something different because, I mean, again, for any kid, for any intervention, if, if we're going really for more than a couple of months and they're not making progress, then we're really, our teams are looking at, okay, what else do we need to do because this obviously is not working. Um, but if they're just progressing slowly, um, then yes, we would, they could spend multiple years in it, theoretically. And I'm, again, struck by the low numbers for that reason because I thought that we had a much larger number of students who are completing eighth grade and not reading on grade level than this. So typically they would need to meet the criteria that's um, up, up there on the board there. And so, you know, kids, um, kids that might not be, for example, several grade levels below may not be in this. They're just slightly below grade level. We talked about that with balanced literacy, or Fonts Pinnell rather. If they're a few months behind in reading, they would not necessarily be in this program because that statistically they're gonna catch back up when we're in the, it, just in the normal course of events. So this would really be more for kids in the general ed population that are, um, I would say significantly below. Um, if you look at the 25 percentile um, in math, that's a fairly significantly below um, indicator. So it wouldn't be necessarily for the kids that are just a few months off grade level. It would be more for those kids that are significantly below. What if, what if they, though, remained a few months below grade level every year? I mean, wouldn't so, they really benefit from this? Well, then, then we would, because if they remained, a four, if they continue to be a few months behind and they eventually were behind, you know, eight months, nine months, then we would be more concerned about a student and would, we would intervene at that point in time, yes. So maybe after a year? Yes. Of um, typically a year. Staying, not being able to keep up? Yes. You would have a way of flagging? Yes. Going, going ahead and letting them try this? Yes, typically, particularly in the elementary level, um, typically it's about a year behind that we would, we would be concerned about. We would throw them in that significantly below category that we would start intervening. A lot of times it's even a little bit before then um, if, we, if we recognize that that's happening um, if, through the Fontes Pinnell benchmarks. Yes, you're correct. Um, let me think what the other question. Oh, re regarding the classroom instruction part, um, I've seen a lot of computer programs for reading that were not nearly as successful and it was be, you know in asking people why or in hearing about it in conferences they would say because a lot of students are not really engaging in their learning on a computer alone in a classroom the way they do when they're actually receiving reading instruction right. and engaging with the teacher so I'm very thankful that we've chosen an intervention that is teacher centered still and I think otherwise we would not be seeing this kind of progress if it's just a computer program would you agree I would with agree with that two? I mean I think that to Dr. McDonald's point I think we will see higher growth than Dr. Royce's point we'll see higher growth over the years as those teachers become more adept at the work they're doing because again keep in mind middle and high school typically we're not trained in reading instruction and so you know that's that's hard to teach sometimes so you know you got a rock star at Northwood so that's why Dr. McDonald sent other people over there to look at and see what she's doing so um, or he's doing she's doing, she she's doing um, and so that that would be a benefit of us as we build the capacity of those teachers we would expect to see higher results as they know better how to intervene with kids um, in one-on-one -on -one or in groups. And are those typical ELA teachers that are willing and being moved over to beef up their reading instruction and work with Typically, those students? Yeah, they're, yeah, they're going to, as a matter of fact, I think believe they have to be for certification the way we have coded. Uh, high school, I know that's the case. High school, they have to be. Um, English, I think middle school. Yeah, because of the certification requirements, um, the way they're tagged in there in order to get, particularly in high school, in order to get that credit, they have to be an English certified teacher in order to get that elective credit for that course. So I guess I'm trying to figure out for teaching, um, for teachers, would they actually be able to apply for a job 
to work specifically with these populations who are behind in reading as opposed to being pulled away from a regular ELA classroom or yeah. doing part of it in one place and part of it in another? Yeah, so most of them actually are full-time in those labs. So yes, they somehow, whether they applied or there's some principal chose to move somebody within the building, an ELA teacher who wanted to do it, um, yeah, in most cases, I think all now, in the case of middle school, I don't believe we have someone teaching English and part um, language library 180. They are full-time, they're in those labs full-time working with kids. Okay, so this is not meant to be uh, insulting just to ask the question, but to understand, you know, how sometimes there's a conversation that we don't send the very best teachers to the very toughest schools and situations. Yep. Uh, the question would be, are we deliberately finding and sending and working with really excellent reading teachers yep. as opposed to people who, for some reason, maybe have not been as successful in their other? So I obviously don't know all of those teachers in those classrooms. I know two of them um, at the um, high school level. Um, and I would say that the two that I know are very quality teachers. They had a passion for intervention, a passion for kids. I think most principals, I think all principals were very intentional in who they chose. Um, I think the first year we had some, you know, not knowing how the program was going to work. I think we had some, maybe some folks in those classrooms maybe that didn't really understand what it was going to be about. We didn't really understand everything and who we really needed in those classrooms. So we made some changes after the first year. The principals did. Um, but I think they've been very intentional. I mean, one thing we've learned is that for the intervention, um, you need your best. I mean, you want your best everywhere, right? Um, but for intervention, that's a hard thing because you're mm -hmm. working with multiple levels of kids. So you've, you've got to have some dynamic, really strong teachers in those classrooms if you're doing intervention. So um, I would say, at least from my perspective, I don't think we'd have that kind of growth um, if we didn't have those strong teachers in there. Um, and I think even in the two schools da um, David referenced, um, it wasn't a matter that <clears throat> the teachers weren't strong. It was just some realignment of implementation, um, just oh, helping sure. them tweak a little bit. Yeah, um, yeah. And I believe we'll see that. But to your point, at the end of the year, if Dr. McDonald or Mr. Reimer or myself were looking at those and we saw some reds in there, we would be going out that school, they would be going out to school and with my support, um, and really exploring, you know, do we have the right person in place for this? Um, if we saw that trend over several years, say, is that, is yeah. that really the right person? Thank um, but you. yeah, we would watch that very closely. Thank you for the answer to this and for all the efforts um, Dr. Royster and all of you for reading instruction. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Meek? I do understand it a little bit more. Okay. Uh, until last night, I don't think I had heard of Read 180 and System 44. Is this in their second year? Yes. Is that right? I did read the article in the the uh, Palmetto administrators that, that uh, Ms. Hogan and Mr. Reimer wrote. I'm going to go back and read it again because I read it on my phone and, and I, I need it in print. I, I've got to so I can underline it, go back to it. So I appreciate their collaboration in, in working with the high schools, whatever. I think it's a great from what I read. And, and I, along with Dr. O'Connor, appreciate what you're doing because I think this is, I don't want to say there have been uh, Un underserved, but uh, this is a big plus in, in my mind if I'm understanding it correctly. So, so thank you very much for that. That's all. Mr. Shamley. Thank you, Dr. O'Connor. The gray bar suggests where we think they should be. And uh -huh. On this on this chart here, for example. Yeah. Uh -huh. Well, all of them actually, but yeah. The gray so the gray bar on the gray bar in this chart is really where we would expect the overall growth, the mean growth in Lexout Point. So we would expect a very uh, high those stu those twenty seven students overall mean to grow by fifty Lexout points. The green bar represents the actual number of points right. as a mean they did grow. Okay, so I guess my question is kind of stupid is, is why does the gray bar vary by school? Is that based on history of the students or, or just what? Uh, it depends on, yeah, it, very, it depends on where the kids started out at. Um, there is certain levels that the kids are going to grow a little bit faster through, very similar to Von Spinell, um, where they would grow faster. So, yes, it really depends on where the students start. 
as far as where, how quickly they grow. And of course, as we talked about, the implementation, the teacher, the how quickly they move, attendance, there's a lot of factors that would influence growth. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Mr. Sudduff. Would you tell me one more time which programs for, for special needs students, which one for regular ed? Yes, sir. So um, for a special ed, it's READ 180 System 44 is the special is what we're using to re intervent, intervene. And then for general ed, it is um, Language Live. Yeah, these bars and charts and graphs, are these made developed by us or by a company? For these us? are the reports we get from the company, really whenever we ask, but these are the reports they would give us typically mid-year and end of year. Have, have we ever gone out to a school and tried to explain this to the parents of the students in that school? Um, I think we would explain it to the parents in terms of growth. So. Here's where your kids start out. Here's where they grow. And we would really more explain, just like we do in Fonta Spinell to parents, we don't necessarily get into all the different instructional independent hard levels. We would just say your kid's at this level and that is at grade level or that's below grade level or that's exceeds grade level. So yes, we would, you know, in those parent conferences that we do and all that, the, the parents have an understanding of this, but we would bring it, we wouldn't get into the real technical details of some of what we did today. All of these special needs has to have an IEP. Correct. And in that IEP, it has to be, this has to be put in there. It's exactly what program they're going to do, whether it's going to the READ 180 or whether it's going to be the System 44. Well, it really, it's it's not two, it is two different programs depending upon they, they're going into, but we really wouldn't know necessarily until we test the student in the reading inventory as far as whether they're going to System 44 or READ 180. So it's about the intervention that they're going to receive. Uh, explain to me briefly, what testing and when we test, at what grade level? Um, for state assessments? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm just trying to look at the reading overall, and then these particular programs that we have employed yep. for reading. I assume that these three programs are programs that go beyond the regular testing. Correct. That for something in our regular testing has said that they need to go into another area or a growth in this because they're not meeting and so we put them into this 180 or 44 or reading life whatever it may be language live yeah so take language live for example so yeah we have criteria for each of the tests that we would look at students based on yes many times it's based on their based on our state assessment um in, in some cases um and, or other measures like up here we use map we've used sc ready we've used for middle school for fonts panel for elementary so yes we would take the baseline tests the kids would do and then based on that we would assign interventions which would be the read 1a system 44 language live and then inside that they would take assessments for lack of a better word to help them know where to start in the program is the language live grade one through 12 um, language live is grade six and nine six seventh and ninth right now six seven eight and nine yeah it can be used in eighth grade we're using it in sixth seventh and ninth right now okay and the read 180 in the system 44 is that what grade level are we looking at read 180 if i remember correctly in system 44 actually go down to fourth grade miss hogan which one second grade you can actually take it down to second grade for read 180 system 44. and up to what grade that way i can go up to 12th grade i mean again it's more based on the kids needs and what level they're at okay That's all I have, Dr. Connor. Thank you. Anyone else? Mr. Meek? A quick question. I was thinking here in my head. Several times you have mentioned that we purchased this program with special ed funds. Is that the appropriate funds that we should be purchasing with that? Yeah. For, um, for, the, for this special ed, yes, that's why we're using it with the special It would not be appropriate for us to purchase for special ed and then have general ed population using it. So, yes, yeah, so, so if we purchase software intervention for special ed students, that's perfectly um, allowable where we should be purchasing it for special ed, yes. Okay. 
Is this just for special ed or can you use it for? It can be public? used for um, general ed as well. We actually do have a few schools that have purchased licenses um, for general ed population. Berea High, for example, has used it with their um, general ed pop. They're, use, they're not li using language live, they're using Read 180 across the board for SPED and for general ed. Okay, thank you. Dr. O'Connor. Yes, I'm sorry that throws me a little bit. Why would they choose that program over the other? And but all of them have teachers involved, correct? Yeah. So in that case, and we've only been doing Read 180 System 44 for in really Language Live two for two years. So in Berea High's case, they felt like they were getting better results with Read 180 System 44. So we allowed them to go Read 180 System 44 for the school. There is a significant cost difference between Language Live and System 44. I mean, yeah, Language Live and System 44 Read 180. Um, so Berea was kind of doing that as a pilot. Um, and then Jason will be looking at that um, over the course of this coming year to figure out is one significantly better than the other one. We're getting results in both of them. Um, System 44 Read 180, Berea High, I believe they were getting better results. Let me, if I might, follow up on, on uh, Mr. Meek's question and yours, Dr. O'Connor. Uh, the original purchase of uh, System 44 and Read 180 goes back to, for lack of a better term, settlement money that we received from the State Department having to do with the issue of the state not, ta not maintaining maintenance of effort for special education funding during the recession. We did locally maintain effort, they did not. So we got some one-time money. So obviously didn't want to put that in teachers or anything else that would be a recurring cost. So knowing that reading was an issue across, to a degree across the board, but certainly with special needs students, we use that money to purchase those programs for special needs. They're, they are, there is a cost to the, each of them per person using it. We cannot use those special ed settlement funds for regular ed students, but we also have language live for the general ed students. Now, to Mr. McCoy's point, once we have enough experience with uh, System 180, uh, Read 180 System 44, backwards, and language live, we may well come to you all next year during the budget process and say we believe it would be worth the difference based on our experience for us to purchase this for all students. So we're, we're in the process of gathering that information. Okay, that's very helpful. I just, for some reason, um, intuitively, it doesn't make sense that um, the levels or the approaches would be similar enough if you're trying to reach students who maybe have certain kinds of disabilities with their reading versus students who are just behind in their reading. So I can't quite see why that would be. Well. Well, I want to make sure that when we are an, are analyzing it, we're able to think about the, I guess the, the, the caps that are set or the benchmarks for each of those, and whether those approaches allow the same ultimate levels and types of growth, because it's it otherwise would seem like we're um, using one program in the wrong way if we're not really positive about that. Yeah, and I would, I would, what I would say is both of those companies would tell you their, their programs are not exclusive to one population of students. Um, there are many districts that use language life for both SPED and for um, uh, general ed. The and benchmarks are based on the individual student. Correct. Not whether that student has a disability or not, or whether they have a disability that impacts their reading ability or not. It's based on the individual student. And probably the better point is the one Jeff just made. Those were not designed as special education programs. They're designed as reading okay. programs. So we have the three. What we want to see is what is the most effective. Now, if the least costly is just as effective as the most costly, we wouldn't want to invest in that. 
So, uh, and I think there's really kind of like three tiers of cost involved yes. between Language Live, uh, Read 180, and System 44. Did I get them right that time instead of you backwards? Did. Okay. Uh, so, w this is the, I think, the first year where we've got data where we believe we have implementation with fidelity in order to look at that to come back and say, well, we think that we'd be best off just doing this one right here. And this is what the cost of that will be. But they are not special ed specific programs. They are student specific programs. Okay. That's helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. O'Connor. Anyone else? Mr. Sutton. Explain to me, Jill. We have regular testing in reading for students in grades kindergarten through grade 12, whatever it may be. And these programs right here, are we, ta are we taking the results from those regular testing programs and saying this indicates that these students are not performing as they should be, so therefore we're going to put them into one of these programs. What I'm trying to understand, we, we talked about the state giving us money mm -hmm and then us doing the testing. So am I correct when I say that these programs right here are not district-wide, or are they? The read one, you mean read one A system 44? Whatever, that or the language line, whatever it may be. Yeah, so they are district-wide for, language live is district-wide sixth, seventh and ninth grade, and read 180 system 44 is system-wide for middle school and high school. Oh, when we have some schools up there but not other schools. So every school, um, the schools, that you, I think the only one on here that, on the high schools that was missing was Malden. Um, and Malden, we had some, uh, we had an assessment issue of, of some sort. And so we are working um, with that data and the school. Um, they'll, they'll have a progress bar at the end of May. At the end of May, we'll have data on Malden. We just had a little fluke at Malden with the data. Uh, and so what about the, the middle schools? I believe, unless they were met, the, let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 up here. So two schools, um, if they didn't meet down there, that little fine print there, so if they didn't meet um, sites with fewer than 10 students or if they had a negative change in average, Lexile would not be shown above. So we'd have to dig into those. And I did look, I have those two schools written down. Dr. McDonald, you may know which two those are. Sterling, maybe. Um, and, and I know that Blue Ridge is using it. Um, and so again, that data, we would, we've, we're looking at that data why, as far as why they weren't here in the mid-year progress. But every school is using it, yes. Okay. Thank you. I'm learning. That's fine, yeah. It's a, it's all I have. It's a lot going on. Anyone else? Okay. Before we go to the uh, next item, thank you, Jeff, for your report. You uh, and I also want to thank not only Dr. McDonald and Mr. Reimer, but Ms. Hogan and her staff for putting all this together because I have a, to Mrs. Morrison Fair's point, I have a granddaughter at Northwood who is a participant in the program and the dramatic increases for her has been exciting to see. And so my thanks to all of you for that. This concludes the uh, instruction portion of today's agenda. Our next item of business and order is the administration portion, which will be chaired by Mrs. Grayson. Joy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, item 3.01, Serene Scholarships Awards. Mr. Rhodes, you want to? Mr. Rhodes, turn it over to you. Mr. Rhodes, come forward. It's always a pleasure this time of the year to share the information with you, the, kind of the overview information about Serene Scholarship. Mr. Rhodes. Thank you, members of the board, Dr. Royster. Happy to provide you with an update on the Serene Scholarship Program, which we'll be approving um, the selected students later this month. Um, this continues to go very well. We, we have strong applicant pool each year. As you can see from the slides, 898 total applicants in our system, and that's made up of 578 new applicants and 320 who are renewals those students that are continuing in college and renewing their, their scholarship for up to three additional years. 
So again, the total numbers just provided for you today, um, 578 new applicants submitted, 320 renewal applicants submitted. And that concludes this presentation. Any questions? Wow. Thank you, Mr. Rhodes. <laughs> Ms. Morrison Fair. Uh, maybe one question, maybe two. Uh, do we have a cap on um, renewals? I'm, a cap, you, you, we have 320 renewals. Yes, Do every student that is awarded the scholarship as a graduate, they are eligible to apply for renewal each year for up to three additional years. So it's a four-year renewable scholarship, that, but they do have to apply to renew it. As long as they're making satisfactory progress toward their degree, whether it be at a two- or a four-year institution, they may continue that. They may take it and transfer that and, and with and take it with them in it, anywhere in the country. So if all of the, so we are able to support all 578 this year if they wanted to renew for th the next three years? Yes, ma'am. The, the, these are again the applicants. So we're not awarding 578, but everyone who is awarded this year, mm -hmm. we will renew them if they qualify. Oh, okay. Our priority is to continue the renewals first we do those first, oh. and then after that, we then provide whatever is left to the new applicants. Okay, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Ms. Lamentis as well. <laughs> <laughs> he disappeared. I'm like, where'd he go? Um, Ms. Rhodes, can you explain what the qualifications are for Serene Scholarship? Applicant. Sure, be happy to. It's a three-part qualification. They, they complete their application, but they also are, are, are evaluated on their, their EFC score, which is part of the FAFSA. So when they complete the free application for federal student aid, every student and their parent gets back a student aid report. In that report comes a num numeral um, called the EFC, and that number is used as a calculator. Um, for to determine financial need of those students. The other two are their grades, which allows for the ranking class and their, their uh, SAT or ACT score. And we align those with the concordance so that if they take the ACT, what is that equal to an SAT? So it's all, it's comparing apples to apples. So those are the three parts, the test score, the grades, and the um, financial need. So um, you take all three of those components. Yes. And is there, is, is it because the students are in need of assistance or is it because they are doing well in school or um, I'm just trying to get a grasp on this. It, it's really a combination. So they, they, have to, they have to demonstrate that they are achieving success in school and the predictability of achieving success in, in their continuing education, but they also do have to show a level of financial need. So it's a, it's a three-part system. So someone with a very high need that did not do well at all in school would not necessarily receive the award. Same is true for someone who scores very well and does not demonstrate a level of financial need. All of those are combined into a system and it's, it's basically generated like that. Good enough. And then one last question. Yes, ma'am. How do these students find out about the Serene Scholarship? We post that. We send it to schools. They are um, putting it in their announcements. We put it on our web page. We, you know, we try to advertise that very heavily. You have answered my questions, and I thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Levin, as well as anyone else. Mr. Lewis. Just a, one quick question. So the limiting factor is the amount of funds that are available. Do you have, I mean, approximately how many students do you think would be qualified for this who you don't give scholarships to? Do well, you, that's or is, good, it, or is it ranked and you just kind of take? It's a ranking system. Okay. Um, and it is based on funding. From, from the percentage that we're allowed to use from the trust each year, which is managed by Wells Fargo. So they, they let us know how much is available. And when that's a, that availability, we go to the renewals, we fund all of those okay. that apply, and then whatever's left, we, we have 
for the new applicants. And, and those funds come to the trust from the foundations? That is that how, how do they get? This, this was a trust established by J.E. Serene. Okay. And uh, we can send you some more. It might be helpful for you to have a little background information on the Serene Scholarship. But, you know, we, we talk about it every year, but it's probably been a while since we've laid out what it is. I, I don't have any other questions. I'd, I'd love some information. Thank you. Thank you for Thank doing you. this. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lewis. Our time has expired. Do you know other questions? Thank you very much, Mr. Rhodes. Thank you. <clears throat> that concludes item 3.01. Item 3.02, teacher pipeline. Dr. Thank, Royster. Thank you, Ms. Grayson. <laughs> uh, Mr. McCoy comes forward. Among a number of different initiatives we're undertaking to try to increase the number of available teachers, one of the things that we wanted to make sure that we paid particular attention to is that in our efforts to create college and career ready students and to create G plus graduates that in that career uh, readiness and awareness, we didn't overlook our own career, that being education and teaching. So it's been almost two years ago now, I approached uh, Dr. Miller, the president of Greenville Technical College, and Dean Peterson, the, the dean of the College of Education at Clemson, with an idea about creating a, an internal pipeline from Greenville County students while they're still in high school that would come back to us as teachers in the classroom, really leveraging the students that we have engaged in teacher cadet, but also the partnerships that we already have where students can earn dual college credit. The vision being that you get uh, as much as you can towards your two or four year degree while you're still in high school, including uh, work with students in our schools that would expose you to education as a career, the idea that if you have that opportunity, that would help you decide perhaps to go into education. It might help you decide that's not what you want to do, and that's important for students to decide what they don't want to do as well as to decide what they do want to undertake as their career. So their initial response was, was resoundingly, we want to be a part of this. We think this is something that would benefit uh, students, would benefit the profession, and would benefit uh, all, all the institutions, Greenville County Schools, Greenville Tech, and Clemson. But most importantly, we benefit students. Now, it took a while to work through all that. As you might imagine, by having to work through all the things that have to be worked through at both the technical college level, who has to answer both to the, uh, the tech commission at the state level, the commission on higher ed, and their accrediting body. And Clemson, who has to answer to their internal, uh, so to speak, bureaucracy, but also to their accrediting body and to the commission on higher education. So although everybody was willing and put forth great effort in it, it's taken us a little more than 18 months to bring this to reality. And we had a, a kind of a public unveiling of it at Malden High School a few weeks ago, but we wanted you to see the details within that public unveiling and how we believe this benefits our students, our profession, and ultimately our district. Mr. McCoy? So as Dr. Royster um, said, it did take about 18 months to do this. Um, however, I think that time was well spent and that it paved the way for future pipelines that will take much less time to do because we worked through all the issues, I believe, um, that we had to work through in 18 months. And so this is the product of that, of that work of a lot of meetings with Clemson and Greenville Tech um, and, um, and us. And so I think it's an exciting expressway or pathway, if you will. We've already kind of um, vetted this with some kids that I'll talk about um, in a second here in the presentation who were um, very excited about the program. Unfortunately, they're graduating this year, so they will not be able to partake in the program, but they were very excited. And it would have been a program they would have participated in had they had it come a little earlier. And so um, Dr. Royster kind of outlined this a little bit already. Um, really, our goal, though, is to really start um, identifying kids who might be interested in the teaching profession as early as sixth grade. Um, really looking at um, some courses that we can put in place, and some of those schools actually already have in place, that really start emphasizing the teaching or the educational field. Um, so we would then follow those kids. Really where it kicks off, obviously, is in 10th grade. Um, again, hopefully identifying kids in 9th grade. Our high schools are starting to do that right now um, for next year, 9th and 10th grade. 
10th grade is really where you start your dual credit, so we would hope that students can get um, anywhere from half a year to a full year in Greenville County Schools with dual credit. Some kids can earn as many as 32 or 35 um, dual credit opportunities. So we know kids will be at various levels, so anywhere from half to full credit. They would then travel to um, Clemson University, or I'm sorry, to Greenville Tech, where they would spend a year, year and a half, and then they would move on to Clemson. So I think this, um, this creating this foundation is critical. Um, pro team, some of you may have heard of pro team. We have a few schools that have pro team in middle school. Um, and that really is to create an interest in education for kids as early as sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. Um, and we will be looking at emphasizing and pushing this program a little heavier now that we have this pipeline in place. So we'll be working with schools to get pro teams in place to start identifying these kids earlier. Most of you have heard of Teacher Cadet. I'm, hit, I'm hitting with you the cornerstones of this program. Teacher Cadet, all of you probably have heard of. We have Teacher Cadet now in all of our high schools. That really is an entry level course as far as helping kids see do I think I might want to do education. Um, so it is a dual credit class. Kids can opt for dual credit. Um, and it is an entry level class. And really, it gives them an exposure to the teaching profession. They go into classrooms, they go spend some time with some teachers in other schools. So they do like a practicum, a mini practicum. Um, but they really learn about education. That kind of is the tipping point, what we would say is the filter for those kids to either say, yep, I want to be an educator or not interested in this at all. And so that's what we really hope that class does, is really filters out who doesn't want to be necessary in education. Maybe they want, they found another passion, hopefully, um, if they didn't want to do it. EDU 111 is something we've only done at Malden. Um, we did this year. I was heavily involved um, with Ms. Turner, Rachel Turner, and we were hoping to have her in her class here today. Um, when we had this originally scheduled for April, they were all going to be here, and then when we had to move it to May because of the press conference, um, exam schedules got in our way. So now they're taking exams, and they can't be here. Um, so we've got some videos to share with you that they sent um, instead. Um, but EDU 111, we've worked through with Ms. Turner. The kids probably spend 80 to 90% of their time actually in classrooms. And so you'll hear from that in the video, but they actually spend that much time with the teachers, whether it be at Malden Elementary or Academy around or even at Malden High School. They're actually getting a really immersed, um, immersive experience in education. So we had nine kids in that class this year. Um, all nine of those kids are going on to, a, um, to an education college to become a teacher. Um, some of you will hear in the video. Uh, many of them, that solidified their decision and actually helped them narrow down to say, I want to be this kind of teacher. Um, and so it was a very, it was an awesome um, experience in there. I was able to teach a few times. Mr. Reimer's been there. Um, Dr. Royster's been there. So we really gave them kind of a full immersive experience in education. The plan is now we're in the process of expanding that class. Um, I know we have Blue Ridge High coming on board next year with EDU 111. Um, and we've got some other schools looking. It does take a little time to get it in place. Um, and so we've got some schools we'll be working with next year by hopefully within the next two years we'll have every high school offering EDU 111 or a version of that class. Um, so if you, those of you who may have gone to college for teaching, um, Ms. Morrison will remember her, um, her student teaching experience. I don't want to say it's as intensive as a student teaching experience, but it's a pretty intensive time. They're spending 90% of the time in the classroom and they're actually reading with kids, they're working with kids, they're intervening with kids, so they're getting a full immersive experience. Um, this, for example, Pro Team, this is just some of the, um, the Dream Quest curriculum that's used in middle school. Um, it, it just it kind of emphasizes what we would talk about in middle school. They would not obviously spend, spend time in the classroom with teachers. This is really giving an introduction to, um, to um, education and also focusing on character development skills, um, building some leadership skills as well. So again, that's something we hope to be able to put in place over the next couple of years in the middle schools. Um, teacher Cadet, again, you've heard of Teacher Cadet. It consists of three main education modules for experiencing education. The goal is to be able to say, for kids on the line, do I want to be a teacher or not? This class hopefully will help solidify that decision for them one way or the other. Um, they do get to observe um, classrooms. They don't do as much, um, as much interaction as far as tutoring and all that kind of stuff. Well, they do a little bit of that. They really are there to observe classrooms, see what teaching is like. Um, and again, as I mentioned, it's available for dual credit should they choose to do it. So I'm not going to read all this to you. I just want to show you what's in the curriculum. Um, you can kind of see what's there overall, awareness and reflection, styles and needs, um, how do you identify kids' learning styles. So you can see in a lot of us, again, for those of us who went to teacher college or went to, to be an educator, it's a lot of the stuff we would have learned in that class right before student teaching or, or through college. Um, how, do, how do you teach different learning styles um, and all that growth? How does, how, how does kids develop cognitively? How do they develop physically, developmentally? So the kids are getting all this kind of head start ahead of time. If they do this for dual credit, this will replace one of their classes in college. Um, they won't have to take those classes that we took in college because this would replace it um, that they've already taken. And so you can see the several um, pages there. 
And then EDU 111, I just put a quote from Jenna. You'll hear from Jenna here in a second on video. Um, but um, Jenna was, this is, I'm not going to read this to you, but um, this, this like, just experience talking to her, for her, solidified that whole student-teacher um, interaction. Um, she'll talk a lot about the relationship piece, how she really made relationships and connections with the kids that she was working with this year. And so I'm going to show you, so there's two, we could have chosen any nine of the students. All nine of these students are incredibly talented. Um, I'm just going to show you both of these videos. I'm Jenna Cunningham. She is a future Spanish teacher or speech pathologist. We put on there, I think in her video now, she is determined she's going to be a speech pathologist. Um, this was, we did this presentation back in February, but now she has kind of settled on speech pathology. That's her, her, her um, piece. Um, Trey is going to be a kindergarten teacher, future kindergarten teacher, and um, he aspires to be a secretary of education for the country someday. Um, he probably will be. Um, he is a talented young man, if you've ever heard him speak, a crazy talented. Um, those of you who know Ron Clark, um, this class got to go down to Ron Clark. They were invited to go down to Ron Clark um, for them to experience that for the day. That's an amazing experience if you've ever been there and done that. Um, and he actually got, um, Ron Clark gave him his personal information um, when he left. So I'm pretty sure he's going to try to po um, poach him um, in three years when he's finished with college. But um, we're going to be staying in touch with him to make sure he comes back here, um, hopefully. Um, so I'm just going to show you um, the two videos. I'm going to start with um, Jenna, and then we'll move into Trey as far as what their experience has been. And again, I apologize. We didn't have time to go do professional videos. They did actually a really good job on their computers. Um, because we, um, I did not think ahead of time the fact that there would be an exam schedule. I didn't even think about that. Um, these kids, for the most part, in the mornings, they spend the entire mornings in the schools in their practicum. So they, have, they would have been able to be here normally, but because of the exam schedule, they couldn't. Hi, I'm Jenna Cunningham, and I'm a student in the EU 111 class at Malden High School. My friend Trey and I were asked to send you a message to kind of tell you what this year was like for us and what the experience meant to us. And oh my goodness, I had no idea how much I was going to need this class. This class actually helped me to figure out the right career path for me. I came in with a totally different plan, and it just goes to show you, you never really know what to expect in life. So I'm so happy this class exists, and I'm so happy it will continue to exist because it can be life-changing, quite honestly. So I came into this year wanting to be a Spanish teacher in probably the high school age range. And don't get me wrong, I do still love Spanish, but I realized through my field experience work in ED 111 class with the second grade class at Bell's Crossing that is Miss Perkerson's. Miss Perkerson was actually my teacher, which is just very sentimental for me. Uh, but one of the projects I got to work on with her in the class was to actually have the kids go through their sight words and see how quickly they could read them, how correctly they could read them, and so on and so forth. So by doing that, I realized I was really interested in how language works as a whole and how kids actually interpret it and read it and create it and produce it to the point that now I'm actually going into school speech pathology. I'm so happy that this path found its way to me through this class, because honestly, I have such a passion and drive for it. I spent this past semester at Five Oaks Academy with a speech pathologist and got to see day to day what it's going to be like, what I could be doing. And honestly, I cannot wait, literally cannot wait. Um, in terms of what my favorite things we did this year, we got to go to Roper Mountain Science Center. And if you're a kid in Greenville County Schools, you go to multiple Roper Mountain Science Center field trips. And I always loved getting to go, but I never really, you know, saw behind the scenes or what all goes into it. And we got to go on a full, like, behind the scenes, all-inclusive tour of Roper Mountain Science Center. And I loved that because I didn't even actually know it was part of Greenville County Schools. Like, I was a kid. Cut me a break. But you know. <laughs> Um, but I loved doing that. I loved getting to have all of our panels. We had panels with the elementary school administration, middle school administration, high school administration. We really got to see like every kind of thing we could want to see, any kind of potential career path we could want to go into from education. There's just, oh my goodness, it's hard to remember all the amazing things from this year. And I only have three minutes on this video, which three minutes is not enough. Like it's not enough to praise this class. But honestly, just please continue to keep this class going. I am so excited for the new development with Clemson. That's going to be such an awesome opportunity for new kids wanting to go into education. And just thank you so much for caring about the future educators. I know that this is a hard time for education in our country. And I'm so happy that Greenville County is really putting forth an effort to get those teachers in, get those education specialists in, so that we continue to have good educators. Thank you so much for this class. 
So Jenna's very passionate. Um, <laughs> all the students are very passionate. I um, had the privilege of, like I said, working with them and really um, co-teaching with um, Miss Turner, Rachel. If you don't know Rachel, she's an amazing teacher. Um, those, the kids will talk about her constantly and that she is much of the reason why they're going into education is because of her. Um, so I was very thankful for the privilege. I don't get to interact with kids at that level much, much often um, because of my job. I have thoroughly enjoyed interacting with these kids, all nine of them, this year. Um, and they will be amazing future educators. So this is Trey. Like I said, um, Trey actually spoke at the um, press conference with Dr. Royster. Um, and so this is his um, take on the EDU 111 class. Hey, everyone. My name is Trey Cornish. I'm a senior at Malden High School, and I was asked to talk about the ED111 program. And this program has just been fantastic. It's really given me a lot of clarification about what I want to do in the education field. I want to teach kindergarten. I've had a lot of um, exposure to the kindergarten field, as well as um, the rest of elementary school. Now I know I want to get a K-6 through certification, and that is really because of the ED111 program. It's really just given me a lot of broad range as well as my other classmates. We've had a lot of chances to go out in the field, get our hands dirty, get some work done with some real teachers in real time. And that's something you can't really get anywhere else. And that's why I'm so grateful to be a part of this program. It really is going to prepare kids for that next level of education who aren't really completely sure if they want to do that or not. It's really going to push them over the edge of yes, they want to do it or no, they don't. But at the end of the course, you still get a recognition for teaching for the profession and Hopefully we get some educators and supporters of educators throughout this program. And it's just been wonderful. We've had some amazing guest speakers. We've been a part of some conferences. I got to meet Ron Clark one-on-one. -on -one. We got to talk about different types of goals I have in, per, um, in education and what he um, hopes for in the world of education, which was really fascinating to talk about with him. And a lot, of, um, a lot of the projects we have teaming up with Anderson have been fantastic. It's really teaching us time management, organizational skills, and all the stuff we're going to need when we go into the field. I really do recommend this program for, once again, anyone who wants to pursue education, doesn't know if they want to pursue education, just knows they want to do something with kids. This program is really just amazing for all of that, and it's really covering every single little base that I, that I could have hoped for to know about the profession. It's really opened my eyes to see um, a lot of the reform aspects as well, and we have had a lot of lessons about what goes into teaching, the rules, the do's and don'ts, and everything in between. And it's just been amazing. I couldn't have asked for a better class to take. And once again, I do recommend it for anyone who does want to pursue this amazing field from what I've found out. So thank you for letting me talk to you guys. And y'all have a great rest of your day. Um, we were able to, in those classes, um, as, as, as we built that curriculum, um, and, and Rachel did the majority of that curriculum, we really focused on um, what can we give the kids now, even things, practical things like, um, you know, one of the things we do with teachers when they come in, or HR does now, is kind of how not to lose your job um, before you started. Um, and so, you know, really doing that with these kids earlier. Um, they're at the prime time of social media. They're at the time, prime time of things they may or may not do in college. Um, and so really talking to them now about, you know, future employment and be careful about what you put on social media because people are going to look at that when you go out to get a job. So um, really gave us the opportunity to do what we normally don't get to do until people are coming to us after college, um, sometimes when mistakes are made and things have been posted. So, you know, now we're trying to catch that a little bit earlier with this class. So ideally, as they talked about a little bit, um, everybody's going to take a little bit different path with this because it depends on how many dual credits they can earn. Um, we will start dual credits as early as 10th grade in this program, so they can start earning their dual credit in 10th grade. Um, depending on how many they take will depend on how many, how many they graduate um, high school with. But you can kind of see the average path, the normal path we expect them to take, is that in our, in our Greenville County schools, um, they would complete the required dual credit classes, hopefully one year's worth is, is the goal. They would then go from Greenville County graduation right into summer of Greenville Tech, and they would spend the summer at Greenville Tech and a year at Greenville Tech, so a year and a half. And then they would go into, after Greenville Tech, a summer at Clemson and, a year, and two years at Clemson. Um, so really, if you do the math, really after high school, they're spending three years. Um, and they, they've got a college degree where most of us spent four or five or however many it took. Um, and hopefully for these kids, it's going to take, you know, they have the ability to do it in three. Now they have an optional, I don't think I put that on here, they have an optional master's degree at, that, at the end of that, so they can actually add a, fifth, a fourth year on after high school and actually earn a master's degree. So again, what most of us took to earn a bachelor's degree in four, they can actually earn a master's degree in four um, and go right out to teaching. And, and the benefit, of course, of that is they'll make more money as well coming out with a master's degree. So the, um, some of the current programs, and that's not to say we won't expand these, we will expand these. I'm already in talks with um, Clemson and Greenville Tech on what other programs we can take. 
um, we can offer. These were the easiest to do right now. Um, some of the other specialized took, are going to take a little bit of work because of the classes and where we can offer the classes. Um, but these are the cur current programs. I think it's nine. One, two, three, four, eight. Um, eight programs up here that we're, we're offering. Elementary ed, special ed, um, secondary ed, English, social studies, biology, chemistry, math, and physics. So these are the, the opportunities the kids will have. They don't necessarily have to declare one of these in high school. It would be helpful, but they don't have to. Really, by Greenville Tech, they'll have to declare one, um, ideally. This is just what it looks like, one, ex one example for Greenville, um, for a secondary English. So Greenville County Schools and Secondary English, you can kind of see we've laid out the path. So we laid out the path for them so that they know if they're wanting to take this path, their counselors can actually put them in these dual credit classes that will set them up very nicely for their path into Greenville Tech. So, once they get in here, and then they will go into, and it says Greenville County, it says Greenville Tech credits down there because um, they're Greenville Tech credits. They're just doing them in high school, um, is why it says GCC credits. Um, so you can kind of see again what they would take. Typically, a lot of these classes our kids are already taking, so this is not a big lift um, for most of our kids um, on that. So that's just one example um, of the secondary English. We've like said so we've got multiple pathways ready to go. Um, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, already um, for next year, Ms. Um, Ms. Turner, she was going to talk about that a little bit today. She was here. Um, but Rachel Turner's now got, I believe, 16 kids in the EDU 111 for next year. So um, from her current teacher cadet program, she's got 16 of the classes that are now they're very interested in, again, pursuing education um, on that. And so whether they choose to go through this path officially and go to Clemson or whether they choose to go to another college, um, certainly they can do that as well, but the goal was to get them as many dual credits as possible when they graduate so that they can knock off the years um, of college in that. So any questions about the pipeline expressway? Uh, Joy. Yes, Ms. Levins as well. So, Jeff, um, is this a, a class that's offered at Greenville Tech or is this a class that's offered at the high schools? These, so these classes, the majority of these classes are offered at the high school, but it does depend, it does vary. Yes, so with that being said, so um, are there certain high schools that are offering them or are all of the high schools offering? And if you're, if you've got 16 students, then does that, does that mean there's one in the class or how, how's that working out? Oh, you mean when they start diversifying into the yes. courses? So, yeah, so for the most part, the, the coursework they do in Greenville County Schools is not as diverse. Um, for the most part, um, all of, for example, all of the majors have to have English 101 and English 102. Um, so that's offered in most of our high schools currently. Um, it varies a little bit <clears throat> once we get into um, things like Introduction to Logic. Um, that would be more of an English major course. So what we're, that's a great question. So what we're looking at doing as we get this started and we get more kids in this program across the high schools, we are looking at working out something with Greenville Tech where we can deliver even some stuff distance learning um, like we do with um, the governor's school um, for the engineering part. Uh, that way, to your point, we wouldn't have to have one kid or two kids or four kids have to travel to Greenville Tech. They could actually join a class of 25 kids across the district. So um, I, I really do appreciate that we have taken this to the next level because years ago, um, I had the privilege of working with Charlie and Betty Templeton at Eastside with teacher cadets. I funded it. Um, and we had Southside, we had te a teacher at Southside, Woodmont, uh, Eastside, and um, there was one other. And we really focused on those young people getting into this field. And it, it does stem with leadership because I will tell you, the program at Eastside was strong with Betty and Charlie. Um, and it was strong at Woodmont. I would go and speak to the classes, and, and we had them at Greenville Tech, and we did fun things with the students, and they were engaging. Um, <clears throat> as I look at the website, um, or your slide presentation, I find something very disheartening. Uh, do you dream of attending Clemson? I, I'm not sure I ever <laughs> dreamed of attending Clemson, but <laughs> and and are we instilling this in our to aspire to? <laughs> but with that being said, thank you so much. It was a great presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Miss Levent as well. I have Crystal, Debbie, and then Michelle. Anybody else? Okay, go ahead. I just want to say thank you, Dr. Royster, and congratulations. Uh, for coming up with such a fantastic and innovative way of really 
getting more excellent students interested in teaching, prepared for it, and uh, hopefully attracted back to us um, with more promise for a you know, better pay and better future. And it, it hits all the right um, spots for what we're trying to do, and it's very exciting to me. Um, it's going to help our current students and future students in ways we can't even imagine right now. Um, one question I have is, and I know that there was a partial answer to it uh, in the last question, but is it possible to go directly from our high schools to Clemson without spending the year on the, at Greenville Tech if they are, in effect, taking the Greenville Tech dual credit classes on campus? Yeah, so they can, and we have some kids do that now, so there are, they could technically skip the Greenville Tech pathway. They may not be able to finish Clemson in three years. They would have to have enough credits, you know, to do that. So to finish a, to finish a year of college in high school is pretty aggressive. I mean, you've got to earn 30-some credits in that. So I'm not saying nobody would do that. We've got a few kids doing it. Um, the benefit of the Greenville Tech is, I, don't, I should have mentioned this, I didn't mention this. Dr. Bruce didn't mention this either, but, um, probably the most important part, um, is that if you, go to the, if you go this pathway and you maintain the GPA and the requirements, you automatically are accepted into Clemson. And so for our kids that we talked to, that was the most um, exciting part because you know, it's hard to get into Clemson these days. Um, and so for, the, for them, it, it, that I, th I think he clarified these days. I think that was some reference back to when I got in. The, 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 bar, the bar is now much, that is not much what I said. higher than it once was. I, I, think that was. I think that was his point. Um, anyway, um, so, the, um, so what I would say is, yes, they can go. Uh, for example, the, the kids that were in, two of the kids in Rachel's class actually are moving directly into Clemson. They were accepted into Clemson. Um, but the idea is we would hope, you know, by the time they're considering going into this program, um, they probably would not be, they wouldn't be accepted to college yet. And so the idea would be that they would get into this pathway, um, and certainly they could apply for Clemson. If they are accepted, they could certainly choose to go to Clemson. There, there is both a, an acceptance mm -hmm. reason, yes. and for our students who need financial help, yep. that's another reason to do the entire or, or the greatest amount of time you can do at Greenville Tech. Uh, our arrangement right now with Greenville Tech is, and the commitment that, uh, that Dr. Miller has made, our students on free and reduced lunch are tuition free for their classes. So there is a financial advantage, a time advantage. Of course, anytime you shorten the time, that, that's a financial advantage as well as a, a time advantage. And then there is the uh, the advantage that if you do what you're supposed to do, you take the classes you're supposed to take, you maintain the 2.75 on the 4.0 scale, uh, then, then you are accepted into the university. You do not go through a separate admissions process. Uh, one, is, one thing is a follow-up um, to the earlier comment. While this was the original agreement and the pathway is with Greenville Tech and with Clemson, from the outset, we have discussed its applicability other places in the state. So once it's set up and done, then Clemson can, if they choose to expand it, could expand it to other districts and other technical colleges. Other universities in the state or colleges, particularly state-supported, could follow the same model because it's already laid out how you do it, and the mm -hmm. approvals are already there. Of course, our first one was obviously with these two, from the outset, most willing partners, which, and you heard Jeff say, it still took 18 months, even though everybody at every level in those organizations was on board with, with doing this. Now, we have teacher cadet throughout the district. We just have the largest program at Malden High, and they have, and they're not the only one, but they have the ED, uh, the ED 111, isn't it right? Mm -hmm. Just the right number. Uh, so there's an opportunity for students at other schools to go into this with or without teacher cadet. Because you can actually enter it without teacher cadet. It's designed to do that as well. Okay, uh, to keep going with that for a second, didn't you say a year and a half at Greenville Tech and two and a half years 
including this summer's at Clemson, well, that's the same as so the, four no, years unless you. Well, so th these would be the summer. So it's one full year, one full, um, one full college year at Greenville Tech, one full Clemson year, or two full Clemson years at Clemson, college years at Clemson, and then you and have the two summer more semesters. semesters. Okay, but if you have a year or, well, whatever the typical number of dual credit courses in high school, then you wouldn't need that many credits. To Correct. Yes, you're right. So yes, it, it, that summer, those summer months, particularly the Greenville Tech summer month, is going to depend upon how many how many credits kids have earned in high school. There are some kids who will be able to skip that summer altogether. Okay, and some who could skip the summer and the first year of Greenville Tech. They're not skipping the Greenville Tech. No. They're doing it on campus Correct. or on site on instead. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, the, so, the, kind of what's laid out there is this is the base. Yeah. The, okay. you know, depending on how well you advance, it might take you longer or it might take you less time, but you could easily do it in this framework. So three years after you graduated high school, you could be graduating with your bachelor's degree and already have an AA or an AS degree. Who wouldn't want to do that? All right. And four years out, the way Clemson has structured right. it, you could graduate with your yeah. master's degree, which for, which really is an even better deal than just the undergraduate. Sure. When you think about basically one more year and some summer work, mm -hmm. you, you got a master's degree. I can't wait to see how that bumps up their enrollment for teacher programs. That's very exciting. Sure. Um, and I just want to echo your comments about Rachel Turner, who you know, been to some of her programs with um, her students and she could encourage any teacher to do their best and to be excited about that profession. So if anybody, I'm, I'm sorry we, they didn't get to come to us. Yeah. I'm glad that we got to see the students, but she's really um, an amazing teacher that yeah. I admire very much. So and I should mention what too, she's doing. Now that you say that, I should mention she is actually the one going to be working with other teacher cadet teachers. Um, oh, so great. we've worked out a deal with Rachel to um, mentor other teacher great. cadets, um, and particularly the ones doing the EDU 111 program. Wonderful. Thank you. All right. Thank, Thank you, Ms. Crystal. Um, Ms. Bush. Yes. Um, well, Dr. Connors um, asked ask one of my questions and the other first I want to thank you thank you so much for the presentation for those of us that didn't get to to come the other day to that and I have to say that um, not only this is just phenomenal but the opportunity to see where the, this could go and um, and you mm -hmm. and you touched on one of my questions I remember talking to dr. Fisher about this um, many years ago and we were talking and specifically into that northern region are for Berea and Traveler's Rest and Blue Ridge at, at she kind of was developing those ideas of, sin, of how close a relationship we could get with North Greenville College to be able to accomplish something like this and she said I remember her saying it would take a lot of work it would take a lot of working together it would take people so thank you for putting in the legwork and putting in all of the hard work to be able to get us to this point um, and um, and I think that was my next uh, led into my next question is is exploring those opportunities for other colleges, for the university center, mm -hmm. for colleges that aren't specifically located within a, a closer region of Greenville, but might be able to work with us through um, through their classes at the university center, um, those type of opportunities, and um, um, and I think we could do some editing on here about you know, do you dream of being a teacher instead of do you dream of attending Clemson? So, <laughs> yeah. uh, uh -huh. so, so we I just don't get what's wrong with dreaming. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, I think one of, uh, in response to 
the other question was, one of the things we want to do, once we get this established and, and up and running, yes. then we would look to, well, are there others who would like to partner in a similar way? We think it's important for us to get it up and, and show right, that it's here, here, here's where we need to do something differently. This didn't work exactly like we wanted to, so that we have a good, smooth model. Now, one thing that was very reassuring, and I think Jeff alluded to this, I went down and met with that ED 111 class, and there were about nine or nine, nine of them, Jeff, all of whom were going into education. Without exception, they all said, well, I wish we'd had the chance to do this. Yeah. Even though many of them, some of them, there were a couple of them going to Clemson, some of them going to uh, Coastal, mm -hmm. uh, Lander, Obviously. North Greenville, Anderson University, but Every one of them without exception said we wish we'd had this opportunity. Well, it's just, you know, it's just taken a little while to, to put it together, but now that opportunity's there. And I think it's really important, uh, and I can't really overemphasize the, the, the partnership part of it with both of them, but particularly with Greenville Tech and their commitment to serve mm -hmm. our students that maybe don't have the financial resources, yes. mm -hmm. which gets us into a group of students <laughs> who may have the desire and the ability, but now we've got a way to help them get there, yes. opening up a new pool of potential teacher candidates for us. That's phenomenal, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bush. If nobody else has questions, I have just have just a couple. Um, so how many schools how many of our high schools are partnered with Clemson already? Um, so partnered with Clemson, we don't really have any partnerships with Clemson specifically for dual credit. Um, okay. We are working, I am working with Clemson right now on um, the EDU 111 classes being offered through Anderson currently. Um, we are actually looking at, Clemson is working with us right now currently. We hope to have the Clemson version of that class up and running in January for the block schools. Um, so that will be our first kind of official dual credit agreement with Clemson University. Now, okay. we do have two others. Not, they're not strictly oh, dual credit, and they're not, one of them's not strictly with Clemson. Art and Architecture at the Fine Arts Center, mm -hmm. if they do all the coursework they're supposed to do, they don't get a dual credit, but they right. are allowed the credit if they're accepted to the School of Architecture at Clemson for two introductory level architecture courses. The Accelerate engineering that we do remotely, at least for the engineering classes, some of them are taught, some of them are taught by professors from South Carolina State, USC, the Citadel, and Clemson, and I believe that's it. It's the, it's the state supported schools who have a college of engineering. So that agreement's not strictly or limited to Clemson, and it's really our agreement through the governor school for math and science who then has the agreement with them but that, those are the two places where we have something similar to a dual credit agreement okay so what about the students in the teacher cadet program who are getting dual credit through north greenville mm -hmm. what it, i mean how's that going to work out uh, so the trend so because well so I, I, teacher cadet program itself they do, the credit will not does not transfer um, anyway, so that's an, a good experience for the kids. And they, they'll get dual credit for it, but it will not trans, transfer into the College of Education for Clemson. The EGU 111 course is the one that transfers into the major. Okay. So, the, so they know, have to go to North C Greenville to get credit. Well, yes, or yes, or Anderson, or you know wherever. There, there's a lot of universities that offer it based on college. I mean, schools get to choose where they take the credit from. Okay. Um, so. It, we're, North Greenville is one of the places. Okay. Now, you know, down the road, you know, whether or not we look at equalizing that across the board, um, because there is some pay differences and dual credit differences that we've heard about. So, you know, we, we've been looking at whether we just equalize that across the board and say we're going to get through the teacher cadet program all dual credit through X university um, or X college. But right now they get to choose based on the teacher cadet website. And I think Clemson's issue with that is they had difficulty lining that up with one of their required courses. Yeah, correct. Whereas ED uh, 111 lines up with their... 1050, ED 1050. 1050. Okay, thank you. And I love the fact that Greenville Tech is letting kids on free and reduced lunch go for free. Um, for the rest of the kids that are kind of, you know, they're not gonna get academic scholarships, but they're not gonna qualify for free and reduced lunch. Is this something that we could look at pay for success financing 
for? Well, now actually, uh, we certainly could look at that, but Greenville Tech actually gives them a reduced rate. Although it's not free, they actually get a reduced tuition rate. It's not the same as a full-time, regularly enrolled Greenville Tech student would pay. We pay I don't about remember, I don't remember the number right now. It's about okay. one third. We pay, we pay, our kids pay basically for three credits what a normal Greenville Tech college kid would pay for, for one. Okay. So we're paying about a third of the cost. But what about the clips and piece? That's the expensive <laughs> one. That's the one that I'm trying to figure so, out. How well, do we get our teachers, you know, educated yeah. at Clemson in the teaching profession funded by oh. creatively? Well, right now, of course, they qualify for whatever state scholarships they would qualify yeah. for. Um, I don't want to speak for the university or the college education, but I do know that uh, the dean has some discretionary funding for students in need, and he now has some discretionary funding from the diversity office for students from diverse backgrounds with, coupled with financial need. So we know that he has some access to be able to help people once they get to the university. And I, and I would not want to say the amount, because I don't, I don't really know the exact amounts. And the other thing too, uh, you know, and a lot of our, the kids, when I, one of the things I spoke to the, this, these group of kids about too, while we know about it, a lot of them don't know, um, is if they come back and teach in certain schools, they can get X amount of their loans paid back for them. Um, and a lot of the kids that, that were in the EG 111 class didn't know that either. So some of that's just an awareness of making them aware that, hey, you might have to take out some college loans, but you actually can come back work in a certain school that qualifies and actually get those loans paid back for you. Okay. All right, exciting stuff. Thank you very much. Oh, I'm sorry, Ms. Caldwell, Ms. Gibbon Caldwell. Jeff, the EDU um, 111, um, you said that y'all were going to start in next January. Is that going to be across the board in all schools, or is it just going to be in Malden? Well, it'll be um, right now Malden's on board. Um, um, Blue Ridge is coming on board this year with EDU 111. Okay. And then we will be working with all of the high schools next year to get them on. They've got to have some things in place, like a strong teacher cadet program, ideally good, right teacher. So, teacher. so if, the school, if the high school doesn't have that in place, Mm -hmm. Is it any way that if, the, if there are students in those schools that want to mm -hmm. go to those, can they go to they the could. Class, those classes in the schools where it's available? Um, if they could get there, they could, but this for the first two years of this program, really, it's not critical. They wouldn't really take this until their senior year anyway, mm -hmm. this course. And so really we've got, that's why we're taking next year, and ideally by the end of the year, this year working with Mr. Reimer, we'll have that course for the 19, let's see, 19, 20, 20, 2021 school year, we would have that in place, hopefully at all 14 high schools. So all of the other courses for the, for the dual credit, all of these um, 22 for the GTC, all of the kids across the board can will yes. be able to access this. Yeah, most, most of our schools, like for English 101 and 102, for example, almost all of our high schools offer that already. Right, okay, all right, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Goodwin Caldwell. All right, there's no other speakers. That concludes item 3.02. The next item on the agenda is 3.03, .03, revision of policy GBRI, personal leaves and absences. Mr. Meek. Thank you, Ms. Grayson. Um, our committee has met several times uh, discussing different items concerning the personal leave, sick days, and so on. We have decided that we would take it very slow and bring item by item to the, to the board, to the full committee. The first item we're bringing today is concerning personal leave days. And uh, in the future, we'll, we'll be looking at other items and bringing those forward as, as we get to it. We have looked at probably 30 some diff different districts districts throughout the state and compared what uh, our district does and what they do. And so we have a recommendation that the committee passed this morning. And to explain that, uh, Mr. Webb, with the help of Ms. Gibbs, will do that. Thank you, Mr. Meek. Um, as, as you recall, the, the item of, of examining personal leave is in the strategic plan. And, and so this accomplishes that. 
Um, uh, so the committee's work is really focused on, on personal leave and, and how many days teachers, employees, both that earn vacation and who do not, uh, should receive. And so the revisions before you, uh, the, the substantive change behind those um, increases, and we believe it's a good thing for its flexibility and, and good for employees, increases the number of personal leave days each employee would receive in the school district. Um, for those that do not earn vacation, including teachers, the number of personal days would go from two to four. Those that earn vacation, 12 month employees included, those, that number would go from two to, to three. And so that would, the number of personal leave days they would receive, employees would receive, would <clears throat> begin each fiscal year. Um, that number, um, whether it be four or three, would begin either July 1st or when they started their work schedule that, that year. So that is the biggest substantive change to this, this policy. And again, we, we think, um, we've, we've heard teachers uh, raise that concern, ask the administration to, to look at it, and, um, and we believe that this is a, a positive stride. Um, the, the remaining parts of this policy are, are very similar to the old language. Um, we believe that it cleans it up a little bit for as far as the language reaffirms um, the flexibility for, for employees to, to take leave. Uh, the, the only uh, additional change is, is uh, that if a request is made within a 48 hour uh, window of the time in which the employee wants to take the personal leave, uh, a time of, of absence that day, um, then, then the principal would have to approve it based upon extenuating circumstances. Um, for example, um, if, if I find out uh, today that one of my children is going to win an award um, tomorrow, for, uh, that that could possibly be an extenuating circumstance, or there's an emergency at their house, you know, a flood or you know something of that nature. Uh, but but again, I think it's important, and the the, the administration really considered this, working with HR and Dr. Royster. Of, of allowing that flexibility at the school level based upon individual circumstances and allowing that principal to review those circumstances and approve it. So all, all requests need to be approved, but that 48-hour window um, need to be based upon some sort of you know, extenu extenuating circumstance. Thank you. I'd just like to add that there is no budgetary consequence to putting this into effect, making an effect of July the 1st, because the employees already have the sick leave days uh, accumulated or will have, and so this will be coming out of their sick leave, so it's, it makes no difference to us or to the budget on, on the mon monetarily wise. That's correct. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, Ms. Levin, as well. Okay, so let me get a better understanding. So they're using their sick leave to compensate for annual leave. Is that correct? So let me let me uh, clarify that, and, and this has not changed. Okay. Uh, I want to be clear that the personal leave days come out of a bucket, their sick leave bucket. Okay. And so that's been the practice. That will remain to be the practice. So, if, for example, if someone gets 15 days of sick leave, mm -hmm they use four, then they would have 11 sick days left. Okay, so, um, so each year, the four days, do those carry over and they could become eight or no? No, no ma'am, okay, they are that's not. Okay, that's all I needed to know. They are not cumulative. Okay, good enough, that's it, thank you. No further questions. Thank you, Ms. Levent, as well as other speakers? Dr. Bob O'Connor. Mr. Meek, thank you for um, your devotion to this cause and the committee work you all have done. Um, I want to understand, is the main purpose to give teachers more flexibility in how they use their time and a little more autonomy in their decision making? Is that the main purpose? 
Are you asking me? Yeah. Okay, to answer. Oh, Madam I'm, Chairman. I'm sorry. I, Ms. I'm sorry, Ms. Grayson. May I ask Mr. Meek? Yes. I, I, I think it does give them more flexibility that instead of, you know, where they have the sick days, which they can accumulate, and the personal days, this gives them, you know, if, if something, an emergency comes up, uh, that they, they can use this as a personal day, or they can plan, like, if they're going to take their child to visit a college or, or whatever. The reason may be they may just need a, a day to stay at, stay at the house uh, and they're not sick. So this allows them, instead of calling in sick, they can call in and use a personal day. So I think it gives them more flexibility. So we probably would not expect to see more absences. I'll ask this to, of Dr. Royster. Um, would you say that we would not expect to see more absences, but just they would be classified differently? That, that, that's our belief, yes. And if we were to start to see some dramatic change, we, we would notice it and say, well, gosh, um, everybody's just taking the four days for whether, you know, I guess we would expect are you expecting that they will all always use? No. no, because they don't all always use their two days, no. But that's not 100%. We, okay. we, have, we have employees that don't ever use either of, that don't in a given year use either of the two they have now. So okay. we don't, but it's cer certainly something we'll monitor, and, and that's why we felt comfortable with this recommendation to the committee that we don't believe that would have such an adverse effect to create any sort of budget issue for us. And I, I think that we should also, you know, promote this as part of our um, support for our teachers to say that we recognize your professionalism and would like you to have more autonomy in how you spend your um, given what would you call this? Your one of your benefits, I guess. Yes, is oh, it's to, a benefit. Um, is to be is to use your benefit in a way that is more supportive of your professional and personal lives. And I, I just think this is a nice compliment to the work we're doing to increase teaching salaries and to provide more professional development, also to or or extra time for breaks. This is another example of Greenville County saying that our teachers are extremely valuable to us and we want them to know it in every way. So, thanks. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know if Mr. Webb mentioned this, he might have and I didn't catch it, but this ties back, uh, you may recall, to your strategic plan in Blueprint 2023. Uh, Ms. Brinkman can probably cite the particular section. But, I bet uh, she can. Particularly <laughs> if I give her enough time to, to think through that. But, uh, that was one of the things that came out of the strategic planning initiative was to look at that allocation of personal days. Uh, so we believe it's certainly fitting and appropriate. We also believe that, you know, one of the most, the most important impact to student attainment is a quality teacher in the classroom. Well, you can, you can carry that on out and say a quality teacher in the classroom present every day they can possibly be present. So we recognize it is very important for our employees to be there, but there are some times and some occasions where they need some time to take care of personal matters, and this, we believe, provides that appropriately. But, it, but it's extremely important for our students that they be there every day they can possibly be there. And that's another reason I think we feel very comfortable with this. I think our teachers have a culture of being there every day they can possibly be there because of their commitment to our students and to our schools. Thank you, Dr. Royster. Um, and I will also add to that uh, what Mr. Meek said earlier about us looking at these one at a time. We're also going to consider incentivizing teachers you know, monetarily when they don't use these days, so that so that they don't feel like they're losing out if they if they can and will be there every day. But that's going to be looked at separately. Okay. So this is just one step, and the overall mission of the committee is to elevate the teaching profession. So this is just one component. Yes, Mr. Sutton. One question, Mr. Webb. With sick leave, you can accumulate that. 
from year to year? Yes, sir. <clears throat> All right, so there's no limit as to how many sick days you can have? As it stands currently, you, you are correct. Uh, when you retire, how much do they pay you per day? Ten dollars, I believe. All right. Why do we say if you take a personal leave, we're going to deduct one day from your sick leave? Why do we do that? Well, traditionally, uh, Mr. Suth, the personal leave uh, bucket has been contained within the sick leave bucket. And so um, that's, that was your past policy. That's been the, the practice of the district for, for many years. And so this, this policy just keeps it within the same bucket. Explain bucket to me. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm trying to think of a better term to, to it com use. comes out of that same allocation. Allocation. One thing that, uh, and, and we often are not good about thinking about some of the benefits and Dr. Ball O'Connor uh, places in terms of a benefit. The state requirement, if I recall correctly, Mr. McCutcheon is a day and a quarter of sick leave per month employed. So the state minimum for a nine month employee would be 12 days. Uh, our district, you all have had a policy for a number of years where that actually for our nine month employees is 15 days, I believe. So the, it comes out of that same allocation of leave for purposes of illness, illness in the family, illness of the employee, and has traditionally been done so for probably since the time there were personal days. It's come off that accumulation of sick leave. Why? Can't, I can't tell you why because I wasn't here when that decision was made. I can tell you that that is customary throughout the state of South Carolina. That, that's correct. Mr. Seth, I, I will say we, we pulled, we looked at dozens of, of policies through South Carolina to take the, the best from each and, and to really review this, this policy. And uh, really throughout, um, personal leave is, is deducted from the sick leave allotment. Is that part of the bucket? <laughs> That's correct. It's part of the big bucket. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sada. Ms. Goodwin, call well. Doug, I have a question about the um, sick leave the, since it's, it accumulates from year to year and when you retire you only get ten dollars per day is that a state law or is that our greenville county law well th th there's not a law on it that that is in our current policy but i don't want to speak for the committee I, I do believe that that's going to be on the table to review down the road with the committee as well so that's in greenville county's policy that's correct only ten dollars a day that's there is, no, there is no established value at the state level for accrued sick leave at retirement. So if any entity, any school district decides to do that, it's simply at their discretion whether to do that or not and the amount for which they compensate the employee. So we'll be looking at that. I believe that's the intent that's, of the committee. Of I would defer to Mr. Meek. Part of the committee, Mr. Meek. Yes, ma'am. We've already looked at it a little bit. We've looked at the comparisons, but we have not discussed it in detail. And what we were looking at is something that we could put into effect this coming year that would not affect the budget. So hopefully we will be bringing this later on this fall uh, and, and we'll be looking at uh, uh, and for you to approve and to approve the budget if there is some consequences to that. I hope so, because $10 a day. But you already got your payout, right? I know. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I had 300 and something days sick leave because I never took time off. And on and behalf they, of Greenville they, County, and we and appreciate it. Not, and they would not give me more than $10 a day. And, but that's okay. And we, and we appreciate okay. it. I'm pushing for the rest of them that's uh, still in here. Okay. okay. Hold, on. Right. hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Thank you. All right. Miss Morrison Fair. <laughs> okay. Can we go back to the bucket? Okay. <laughs> okay. Good old bucket. <laughs> I just want to make sure I understand, okay, we get sick leave, it's accrued, then starting July the 1st, we will add three days to that. Three days for those that earn vacation, employees who earn vacation, four for those that 
do not earn vacation. Okay, okay, the different categories. Okay, so when you add my three days of personal leave at the end of the fiscal year, if I don't take that, it's deducted? Well, let, let me be clear. Just the personal leave so, part. So the, so the personal leave part, if you, for, for example, maybe the best way to do this is to give examples. If you do not take three days of personal leave, <clears throat> then that sick leave, it would turn basically into sick leave and roll over into the next year as it currently stands, okay? But that employee would then still have three days starting July 1 mm -hmm. to take personal leave because it would renew that next fiscal year. But it's not part of like the 20, it wouldn't be part of the 2020 personal leave, it'll be brand new personal that's, that's leave. That's correct. So that personal leave that I did not use will turn into Sick leave. Sick leave. Okay. It'll go Thank back. You. It'll go back to sick leave, Ms. Marshall okay. Fair. It came from sick leave to okay. begin with, and if you didn't use it, it'll go back. Okay. So let's say you started the year with 30 days of sick leave. Okay. Let's use the teaching example. So you're a teacher. You had 30 days of sick leave. You got your four personal days. They were advanced to you at the beginning of the year in case you had a reason to be absent before you, so to speak, earned them during the year. But you didn't take any of those nor were you out sick any that year. Now, at the end of the year, you have the 30 days you started with plus the 15 that you earned during the year, but you still have the full 30 days because you didn't use any of your personal days. So you would have 45 days. The beginning of the next year, your four days personal come off of the 45, leaving you with 41 for sick leave. Now, of course, if you were to get to the end of the year, had some illness that struck you, and you needed to go back and use the personal, so to speak, personal days for illness, you could do that. You could use them for any reason. I'm, I'm like Mr. Southern. I still have to, I need to process that bucket again. I have to think about it. I don't have a question right now. I'm, I'm not the, understanding. The, here's the only thing that changes. This might, maybe this will help. Okay. Instead of taking two, now you can take four. They come from the same place they've all, always come from. So that would be no change to an employee. Why could I not take four before? Because your policy said you, that uh, an employee could only take two. The board's policy. Okay. That, so that, that's really the only change in it. And you can have them at the beginning of the year. Those are the two changes. You don't have to earn anything. So you get, get, the, you get four and you get them at oh, the beginning right of the year. Oh, right off the bat. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Levin Savos? So, um, I'm all in favor of accumulation of sick leave and et cetera. I will tell you there are institutes that will limit you when you retire. You cannot, you can only take so many. You can have, you can have 360 days, but you're not going to get paid, but for 45. <laughs> uh, no, it's a state. And so, I mean, there are stipulations, and I know every institute is different, um, but it does, ref it does affect the retirement system and so forth. It, it really, a lot goes into all of that. So you gotta look at the big picture. So that's just an FYI, and, um, and um, thank you, bye. All right, I have a recommended motion from the ad hoc committee Ma for personal Chairman. policy, Mr. Meek. Thank you. I just want to mention, I, I'm not sure because I was not aware of it until I got in this, that new employees are given their total sick days on day one of their, and, you know, in the next year, then they accumulated a month and a half and so on. But the first year, we give new employees their total number of sick days because as, as uh, Dr. Royster reminded me this morning, you know, that sometimes all these virus and disease are out there, these employees, uh, uh, new employees catch that first year until they get an immune system built up. So, so the district, this was, I don't know how many years it's been in effect, but quite a while. So new employees do get that already, which is a benefit. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Meek. All right, I have a recommended motion from that hot committee for personnel policies. Do I have a maker?
Madam Chair, may I make a motion to approve? Thank you, Mr. Meek. Coming from committee, it needs no second. Second. Any further discussion? What? Oh. <laughs> All right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? And the motion passes. And that concludes the administration portion of today's agenda. Thank Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Our next item of business and order is item 4.01 uh, under building and grounds, which will be chaired by Mr. Shamley. Roy. Great. Thank you. You'll see the attachment and the board materials outlining the uh, activities. And at this time, I would uh, turn it over to Mr. Mills to give us the update on this uh, aspect. Thank you, Mr. Shamley. Good morning. Uh, are there any questions or does anybody have any specific items yeah, they'd like for me to cover with, with the Thank facilities you. update? Mr. Chairman. Roy, yes. Go ahead. Okay. Um, Terry, <laughs> under the Malden High School roof replacement, you have <coughs> Otis Raven listed as project manager. He's no longer with us. That's correct. Who um, took his place? Uh, uh, we hired a new employee. She started yesterday. Her name is Teresa Champion. Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, also, the uh, bids for the Greer High School projects. Uh, we received in? the bids. Um, excuse me for a second. Let me. I know you, uh, haven't, you haven't recommended an award yet. All I'm looking for is are they within the budget that we yes, set? Yes, sir. They were, they were within the budget in the um, the uh, firm is, um, we've issued an intent to award to Mashburn Construction out of uh, Columbia, South Carolina. They do have a local office and presence here in Greenville. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Any other questions? Yes, Dr. Bell Yes. That doesn't mean that you've got other intent to award notifications you can give us on this list, does it? Like we've found no, no, the fount, okay. the, bid, the okay. bids are not in. No, ma'am. That's all. Yeah. Anything else? Yes. Terry. Yes, ma'am. Is Carolina High School done? The yes, ma'am. It was completed um, the, the before the end of March. You're talking about the uh, the shade, shade canopy. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. It's it's up. Done. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Roy. Yes. Yeah. Our security cameras update. Uh, for, for we got completed. All schools are completed. Yes, sir. All the schools are complete. Um, there are four locations remaining. Um, they are the Roper Mountain Science Center, which is 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 in progress. The bus center is the central office and space drive. We will be doing them in that order. Have we already budgeted for those four items? Yes, sir. There was some funding um, in the original security camera project for those sites. So that money in security camera takes care of all four of them? Yes, sir, it will. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. Anyone else? If not, I'll submit that as a report. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes our Committee of the Whole agenda for the day. We'll, the chair will recognize someone for a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. We'll have a motion made and properly seconded to adjourn. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? And motion carries. Uh, we have a called board meeting immediately following this board meeting. I'm going to uh, take, say that we take a five minute break and then we'll call our special call meeting to order. Thank you. We'll have to call it to order in here. Uh, 2019 to order. Um, everything on the agenda is relatively personnel related. So is there a, mo a motion? A motion to go into executive session? This is first now. Second. For personnel and legal and legal matters. We got a legal time. representation to address also. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. aye. All opposed? 
we will adjourn to um, conference room A and reconvene there. Uh, sit down. I'll now reconvene the, the board in public session. We came out of executive session with no action taken in that conversation. First item on today's agenda is item 1.01, .01, personnel recommendations. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Meek. I make a motion to approve the personnel recommendations as presented. Second. I have a, pro a proper motion and seconded. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion stated, please say aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Dr. Royster, would you like to make some introductions? My name is Sailors. I would. Uh, we have two of those appointees present with us today. Uh, all of you already know Robin Stack. Uh, Robin, if you, but you stand up anyway. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Who is now the, uh, the new uh, Executive Director of Finance, succeeding uh, the very capable Jeff Knotts. And we are most fortunate that Robin expressed an interest in this position. She's done a great job for us in the roles that she has had in her number of years in the district. And we look forward to having her in this new leadership role. Uh, we also have seated next to Robin Stack, Dr. Scott Turner, who many of you know personally, and I think all of you know by reputation, <laughs> who is our new Deputy Superintendent, and we Speech. are most pleased to have him join Greenville County Schools. He has a stellar reputation. It's been my good fortune to have worked with him several years now as colleagues and through work at SCASA and through our mutual interest in having adjoining school districts. Uh, we are most fortunate that Dr. Turner expressed an interest in coming to Greenville County Schools and look forward to having him here. Scott, welcome. Robin, congratulations. We have some others who are not with us today, but as we traditionally do, we'll try to get them at the next regular board meeting so that you might uh, see them and be publicly introduced to uh, our new Executive Director of Facilities, uh, uh, Scott Carlin, and our new Director of the Fine Arts Center, V. Popat. Uh, now, Mr. Carlin will be here later in the week to be introduced to his direct reports and so forth. And Mr. Popat, who was supervising the first day of statewide testing in his current school, was introduced via interactive uh, television, uh, I believe, yesterday, if I remember correctly. So, but he will be here later in the in the in the month for you all to see. So is, it my, is it my imagination, or is Jeff's color in his face getting a little better now? <laughs> <laughs> you, you're smiling now, okay. Uh, next oh, well, item. She's she been doing most of his work already. So, yes, okay. I, yeah. Uh, <laughs> okay, let's get it back on the track. Well, obviously, here. you're highly regarded, Jeff. Our next item of business in order is item 2.01, the approval of legal representation. Is there a motion? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Meek. Make a motion to approve providing legal representation for Jonah Smith in accordance with board policy GAEA -E in a matter of. 2019-CP-23-02309, period. <laughs> I have a motion properly made and duly seconded. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion as stated, please say aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries. Chair will entertain a motion to adjourn. Second. Have properly made and seconded. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries and we are adjourned. Thank you.